They just informal meetings, not made decisions. But uh, first item up is a Waterloo sesquicentennial moment brought to you by Councillor Whaley. Well, thank you, Mayor. If there was one we village of Waterloo back then we had 200 people living in Waterloo then the village of Waterloo had people so common like our I'm a No public infrastructure. Uh, it had nothing really but a couple of. Federal uh, has carried over in, in, the, in the last 150 years, but two institutions have stood time. Get a look night. You see up the top our one-room schoolhouse, and it was the first building of our educational stream. And from humble beginnings of this one-room schoolhouse, that's now in Waterloo Park, by the way, education has played an amazing, an important role in local culture, as we all know. Could the kids sitting in those rough-hewn benches way back then have even imagined that the city would grow to three post-educational institutions? You see just one of them in the uh, overview to the, to the bottom right. A plethora of high schools and primary schools and 150 research institutes, some global, globally recognized. And what about the next sesquicentennial? We should ask that question today. Now, what, what will uh, what will be what will be famous for? And my hunch is it'll still be famous for education, but it'll play an even greater role in the global and probably intergalactic uh, age. I'm, I'm predicting that for sure. And the other institution that stood the test of time is local government. We've all heard stories about uh, the, uh, the t town or the village council meetings which are held in a, in a, in a, in a bar, ra rather a hotel. And that hotel still is at King and Herb today, making bylaws like uh, uh, keep farm, keeping farm animals off the street and other such weighty matters of the day. And the picture to the right uh, was of our first city hall, and that was uh, that place was called the center of everything because it housed council chambers, a stage, and a meeting hall on the third floor, uh, a police station, a library, and market stalls in the basement. And it's that particular, if I can have an aside, that particular picture was taken on Armistice Day, 1918, at the end of the Great War, and we managed to cap capture that picture. And look at how the city has changed in just a few years that now electricity and roads and buildings that we recognize today uh, that's the uh, to the far right is where the new data hub is and that still survives today and uh, this was a, a period of what many consider our first renaissance and who many consider our second renaissance we're going through right now today on the bottom picture we are housed in this lovely city center complex uh, continuing to provide policy and leadership for now over 130,000 residents. And I predict that the, the Waterloo of the next sesquicentennial in 2177 will still have a strong governance model, uh, but we'll have neighborhoods with the names of Stratford and Guelph and Ayr and Elmira, but we'll yet continue to remain that center of excellent go governance. So if there's one thing that I do hope that passes down from the uh, generations from 1867 through today until then is that plaque right up there that has one word on it uh, and then that is stability and that word has really served the citizens well from 1867 to 2017 and off to our next sesquicentennial. Thank you, Councillor Whaley, for that fulsome... <coughs> It was like you were living back on the old days of that old schoolhouse. That's Memories. old for me. <laughs> and uh, for the crest, I always tell people stability. It's because even a rocket needs stability. 
that's where we are. Uh, first up on staff reports is our 2015 to 2018 strategic plan, our 2017 progress report brought to us by Brad Witzel. Welcome, Brad. Second, while Lissy uh, pulls up the presentation. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Jaworski, uh, members of council, senior staff, and members of the public in attendance. It is my pleasure to be here this evening providing an overview of the 2015 to 2018 strategic plan, 2017 progress report. In terms of strategic plan reporting, this is the second annual um, update report for this strategic plan cycle. And a final update report will be provided in late 2018. Additionally, each year, our communications team publishes a community yearbook highlighting the year at the City of Waterloo. And the 2017 yearbook will be targeted for release in early 2018. Before providing some highlights uh, from the report, I would like to note a few additions to this year's report. So new for 2017 is the introduction of a stoplight approach, which categorizes each of the 65 reporting initiatives as either completed, on track, behind schedule, or at risk. Overall, there's been very good progress with the majority of the initiatives being classified as either on track or completed. Another addition for this year's report is section five, efficiencies, innovations, and awards. Waterloo has a, con has a culture of continuous improvement and efficiency, and the city also has a history of being innovative as showcased through our smart city initiatives, which can be found on our website. The progress report and appendix will provide examples of these efficiencies, innovations, and awards. However, a few are noted on the screen. So next I'll just touch on some highlights under each of the six strategic priority areas. So first under multimodal, on June 26, Council approved the stationary planning, official plan amendment number 14, completing the stationary plans. The benefits of LRT and stationary planning are already beginning to take shape with significant development occurring along the line. On March 20th, Council approved the University Ave study. The city has partnered with Wilfrid Laurier University, the University of Waterloo, Conestoga College and the region of Waterloo on the um, University Ave streetscape with the goal enhancing uh, streetscape along University Ave and improving uh, the gateway. Throughout 2017, the city has invested in numerous com complete street upgrades, including Columbia Street West, Marsland Drive and Spruce Street. Under infrastructure renewal, on July 25th, the governments of Canada and Ontario announced $3.28 million in project funding for Waterloo under the Clean Water and Wastewater Fund. Thanks to this investment, residents of Waterloo are benefiting from several accelerated projects that will remove built-up sediment from our stormwater ponds while also assisting with the Sanitary Master Plan climate change impact mitigation strategies. On March 6th, elected officials, staff, and consultants officially celebrated the completion of the service center rehabilitation. This major project included the construction of a lead silver administration building expansion, construction of a new salt structure with underground conveyor um, unloading system, and a new main entrance canopy. And finally, to date, the city has 45 designated heritage properties in one heritage conservation district. In terms of city-owned heritage assets, Currently, there are four, including the Carnegie Library, Elam Martin Farmstead, 
Waterloo Parks Log Schoolhouse, which was uh, mentioned earlier, and the Button Factory. So under strong community, just this past Monday, November 20th, Council approved the Library Operating and Funding Agreement and the Eastside Library Feasibility Study. With approval of these two reports, in addition to the amazing work of staff and the Library Board over the past few years, the Eastside Library has more than been advanced and is scheduled to be opened in the fall of 2020. On February 6, the City's Manager of Museum and Collections provided Council with an update on the Museum and Collections strategy. Of note, after years of hard work, the City's Pierce Arrow delivery truck has been restored as showcased at the 2017 Oktoberfest Parade. And additionally, over the course of 2017, significant work in progress has been made on the older adult recreation strategy and the neighborhood strategy. Final reports and recommendations for these projects will be presented to Council in late 2017 and early 2018. Environmental leadership. On April 10th, Council approved the Silver Lake Funding Release Report. The Silver Lake Class, e, Class EA Addendum will determine the, the preferred rehabilitation option for Silver Lake and Laurel Creek, with the project then proceeding to detailed design and construction anticipated in 2020 with a goal of restoring Silver Lake to its former glory. On November 20th, Council approved the Draft Community Energy Investment Strategy. In collaboration with local partners, this strategy is a community-scale energy planning initiative designed to achieve a variety of goals related to energy management and economic development. Additionally, in 2017, Waterloo launched the pilot program installing um, dog waste receptacles in three Waterloo parks. This is the mayor's uh, project. Um, so this eco-friendly project uh, being the first of its kind in Canada, and this uh, project is, is made in part through a partnership with manufacturer um, Sutera. And on February 27th, Council approved the City Warlu Living Legacy 150th Tree Planting Program. Trees were given away at seven ward events, the 25th Annual Service Centre Open House and Warlu Earth Day. Over the course of the next five to ten years, these trees will have a significant impact on our tree canopy coverage as they will be planted on private lands which are normally outside of the scope of the City's control. Under Corporate Excellence, in 2017, the city collaborated with regional municipalities on numerous joint projects, including the work of the kitchener Warloo Joint Service Initiative Committee, the region-wide voice radio infrastructure replacement project, and the city's automatic aid agreements with the townships of Wilmont and the townships of Woolwich. Corporate Communications is partnering with Municipal Enforcement Services to pilot an agreement whereby the city of Kitchener's um, after Hours Call Center will provide after hours call support to municipal enforcement. And additionally, in 2017, staff initiated a corporate website refresh and the automation of the City Hall main switchboard. And finally, under corporate excellence, the data center was officially relocated on April 17th. The migration of the data center was a highly complex project involving an extensive team of staff led by information management and technology services and facility and fleet services. Economic development. On February 22nd, 2016, Council approved the Uptown Community Improvement Plan program activation. On December 11th, 2017, staff will be providing the 2017 update report, which will provide more details on the program uptake to date. However, at a high level, there has been almost 50 CIP applications approved awarding approximately one million grant funding in Uptown. Development of the West Side employment lands is ongoing. RFP 17-01 for consulting services to carry out land use planning and engineering of the West Side lands <coughs> was awarded to Stantec Consulting and it is anticipated that a draft plan will be presented to Council in the fall of 2018 for approval. And on <coughs> September 18th, Council approved the development charge update. <coughs> Through this report, Council approved the continued use of citywide rates for developing the DC bylaw. And during this um, review, staff did investigate the viability of adding additionally discretionary exemptions, such as uh, those for affordable housing, 
However, it was determined at that time that those type of discretionary exemptions are better served outside of the DC bylaw through a policy or CIP providing more flexibility. So the DC bylaw is scheduled to return to Council for final approval on December 11th. So in conclusion, um, CAO 2017-028 is being provided for information. Um, however, I'd be happy to answer any questions that uh, Council has in regards to the report or presentation at this time. And I'll just note that the report is available um, online as well under our strategic plan webpage, which houses all past versions of the update report and the um, community yearbook. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brad, for that wonderful presentation. I think uh, as councillors, well, we'll find out so soon, but uh, as councillors, we're all proud of the uh, strategic plan put together and uh, the, the efforts between staff and and uh, council working hand in hand on this project so it looks like a lot of accomplishments first up is Brian Burke any other comments or questions go ahead yeah Brad it's a great report it's nice to kind of see where we were and, and where we're going and how we got there but uh, and there are in your stoplight system very few reds which is nice to see but are there things in Are there, are there steps that we can take to move those ahead in maybe a more timely fashion? Question. Um, so as noted in the port, the report, um, staff has made every effort to minimize the amount of, of at-risk red items. Um, however, with only one year remaining in the strategic plan cycle, it would probably be unlikely to accomplish those uh, next year. However, we can look at where we can make some progress on them. So. Um, one in particular would be the, the addition of So under that particular example, what we have done is tried to do things that we can help um, around that. So where we're providing freezing parking rates for 2018. Um, recently, I think last Monday, Council extended the two-hour no-charge parking for additional hour. And under that one, we also extended the agreement we have with the park aid. So under those that are at risk, they're, they're not going to achieve the specific initiative within the strat plan, but we're doing things we can to kind of help that initiative and move it forward. Um, but we will definitely, as an organization, look at any where we can kind of make any incremental progress and then uh, defer it to the next strategic plan. Thank you. Mr. Whaley. Yeah. I think a, a scorecard is good for council and good to, for staff to have. Uh, but uh, it's also good for citizens to uh, have as well to uh, help them understand uh, the value they're getting or not from uh, their from their local government. Uh, how do we uh, get this information into the hands of the public so that they can uh, look at the scorecard and see if they uh, want us to be on the team next year? Through you, Mayor Jaworski, to Councillor Whaley's question. So I, I think we can look to... However, the community yearbook is really that um, community-focused version of this. So um, we, you know, might be hard-pressed to get residents to read this 40-page uh, document uh, cover to cover. Um, however, hopefully we can have them um, maybe review it and kind of look at some of the key highlights. But the, the yearbook is more of a video type of uh, imagery with some key statistics where we can help to kind of drive home some of those successes. So we'll look to do that. Um, in, in early 2018, like I mentioned, and then maybe we can put some messaging out around. Uh, that's the community scrapbook, but it seems to always highlight the positives, and I think our citizens need to know, uh, and there's not too many examples, thankfully, as uh, Councillor Burke has said, of things that are behind. Most are on track, for sure. But... Uh, you know, we, they, they, our citizens need to know warts and all, not just a, a beautiful little video saying, isn't, isn't, uh, isn't it wonderful? But what's really going on? Further comments? Together, uh, and more focus. 
than in previous iterations of, of council. You know, I know my objective has been to make sure that we have a strategic strategic plan, uh, which requires a, a focus list of, of items that people can easily understand where we're going. So I think this this cycle we are well on our way to a plan that looks more. I know you know highlighted that uh, the um, uh, in response to questions when we approved the strategic plan that the amount of it that we could accomplish this term was dependent on the resources we were able to allocate to it I think this council was able to allocate a number of resources and staff were able to be creative in a number of uh, capacities to be able to advance us through uh, you know reasonably successfully successfully through This has come up early next cycle. Uh, so I commend staff for that work and, and council for, for its job in putting its money where its mouth was uh, in terms of achieving the goals that uh, we all set together. Thank you. I think that's it. What? Uh, how many um, uh, tasks did you say were on the Brad 60? Yes, yeah, so uh, to you, Mayor. The, um, the reporting level, which is the initiative level, has 65 of items and then um, to echo councillor burke's point i think there are only there are two red three yellow so 60 out of 60 to thank mr anderson thank you for all the work that your team does but uh, uh to uh, brad yourself for your work as executive officer on the strategic plan as well as uh reinvigorating the joint service initiatives which are also important for having an effective efficient government uh thank you for your work on that and it's uh, certainly Exemplary, and I think that's what uh, we want to give the uh, citizens of Waterloo. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we need a motion on the respectively, with regards to. Zoning bylaw amendment number Z1714 and plan of subdivision 30T17401, Gabriel Elizabeth Groff and 101781 Ontario Limited, Northgate Land Corporation, and zoning bylaw amendment Z17-15 and plan of subdivision 30T17402, 1455 Ontario Limited, with respect to this application. Tonight's comments will be taken into consideration in developing a staff position on this application, and a staff report will be considered by Council during a formal public meeting at a future time. All property owners within 120 meters of the subject lands and anyone who signs the registry will receive notice of the formal public meeting. Anybody who wants further notice of this application, including the formal public meeting and passage of any bylaw, should sign the appropriate registry located at the on the overview of both of the applications. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. Good morning. Or sorry. It's been a long night. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor Jaworski, <laughs> members of council and the public here tonight. Um, for this informal public meeting, I'll give an overview of those four applications you've just described. Um, although these applications are, were submitted separately, the intent is that they will form one cohesive development, so I'm going to avoid duplication and uh, make one presentation tonight. Uh, the Herbsville Cartway lands are shown here in yellow, and the Northgate lands are shown in green. So. Um, just to backtrack for um, ease of reference, I'm going to um, zone change Z1714, those lands I'm going to refer to as Northgate, and Z1715, uh, I'm going to refer to those as uh, the Cartway lands. So um, they're located in North Waterloo, uh, southwest of Conservation Drive and Beaver Creek Road. The lands to the west of these 
subject lands are generally privately owned uh, single detached homes. Um, to the north are also some additional single detached um, homes and properties with Creekside Church. Um, these lands here are the subject of an active zone change and subdivision application. Uh, to the east of the property is um, Green Acres, um, which is a seasonal um, trailer, trailer park. And further from that is the Laurel Creek Conservation Area. Uh, to the south of the subject lands, the city owns a portion of lands in this area, directly south of uh, the Cartway lands. There's a landlocked private parcel in this area, and then the remainder is uh, owned by the Grand River Conservation Authority, and the Nature Center is located uh, in this area here. So the Cartway lands are approximately 6.5 hectares, and the Northgate lands are approximately 49 hectares in size. The Northgate lands um, don't contain any structures. Um, a significant portion of the lands are um, being uh, actively crop cultivated. And the Herbsville Cartway lands contain a number of buildings. There's one up here and a, a few in this area here that are all related to the uh, go-kart operation. There's also a long access <coughs> road in this location off Conservation Drive. Beaver Creek extends uh, through the Northgate lands and Laurel Creek extends through the Herbsville Cartway lands and they converge in this location and are directed south to the reservoir. Um, the, the, there's actually a, a kind of a valley in this area of the property. There's quite a grade change between the lowest point and the highest point. It's about 13 meters or 50 feet. Um, th and this is a consolidated view of the two draft plans that have been submitted. So they share this property boundary right here. Looking at the plan holistically, it's really one new neighborhood bisected by environmental lands, it, generally in this area. There's also some additional uh, environmental lands on the, uh, in this area, in the Cartway lands. Um, the plans show a new internal road network with three access points from Conservation Drive, one in this location, second here, and a third close to the intersection of Beaver Creek and Conservation. Um, there's also two accesses off of Beaver Creek Road. Uh, the environmental lands and some of the buffers, uh, which cover about 12 hectares, have been excluded from the Northgate draft plan and would be under private ownership. The environmental lands uh, within the Cartway lands have been included in the limits of that application, um, but they would also be held in private ownership. There's a few exceptions where some of the environmental buffers are proposed to be con um, conveyed to the city. The plan is really made up entirely of blocks, so they would be developed and possibly severed further into lots um, through the process of other part lot control, site plan approval, uh, plan and condominium, or a combination thereof. The orange circles are basically showing you larger blocks that are intended for multiples and medium density type um, housing forms. Uh, this area of the plan is also, uh, even this area as well, is really intended for uh, additional commercial uses in a mixed use format. Um, the P, the green P's I've identified are where the parks are proposed to be located and some of the walkway connections. The SWM is stormwater management, so there's some areas of the plan where that's proposed. There's two pumping stations, one that will serve this portion of the development, so on the west side of the environmental lands in this location along Conservation Drive, and there's a second one that would serve the easterly side of the development that's uh, accessed off Beaver Creek Road. Um, so really the remainder of the, pro of the um, subdivision would be lower density forms of housing, singles, and semi-detached. Um, so upon full build out, the subdivision would contain about 645 to 870 units, quite a range they're proposing, and that's about 1,200 to 1,800 new uh, persons and jobs in this area. The plans are intended to be registered and developed in stages, so Northgate has five stages. Um, one and two are on the east side, and three, four, and five are on the west side of the environmental lands. Um, the, so really, there's an, there's an intention here to consolidate some of the blocks that cross over that shared boundary. The yellow is uh, also a, a plan of, it's a, proposed to be a uh, condominium, so lots fronting onto private roads. It's just shown as a block on each plan at this point, so 
the further subdivision of those lands would be done through a separate condominium process. We can still kind of, we can still control how those lands are developed though through the subdivision process. This is the proposed zoning schedule that would implement those draft plans. Um, it includes, uh, so these applications do include all of the lands, um, including the environmental and buffer lands. So the properties currently are zoned agricultural and they're proposing to rezone them for a predominantly um, flexible residential, which is intended to permit semis and singles and towns medium density three, which are these orange blocks, and they are intended for more medium density style of housing. Um, apartments are permitted on those blocks along Conservation Drive and Beaver Creek Road only. Um, for the block closest to the intersection here, this is considered to be within the node of this district, and the idea, as I said, was to allow for a mix of uh, ancillary commercial uses in a mixed-use format. So they've they've proposed sort of triple zoning, if you will, um, these lands to implement that vision, and uh, we'll be looking at whether that is the most appropriate zoning approach here, or is there something a bit more streamlined we can in introduce. Um, the G1 zone is all the environmental lands, the buffers. The G2 zone is intended more for um, public parks um, and also uh, municipal stormwater management facilities and and uh, pumping stations. I know they've shown G1, but I think maybe those might be more appropriately zoned G2. Um, in addition to changing the zoning categories for these lands, they're also looking at tailoring the performance regulations um, quite, quite substantially in some cases. Um, and they're also introducing uh, backed about towns, which is a type of housing that we don't currently um, just define in our current zoning bylaw. We, we will in our, our new draft bylaw. So um, there's a range of, of adjustments they want to make to these zones, height, density, parking, setbacks, There's a complex policy framework that applies to these lands as well, and I do want to just go over them um, as briefly as I can, but I think it's important to look at that. Um, we have a regional official plan. We have uh, the city's official plan. We have a, a district plan that um, fine-tunes the, the proposed vision for this area. There was a North, Water, uh, North Waterloo Scope Watershed study that was done. The Grand River Conservation Authority regulates these lands, and there's also some provincial legislation that comes into play with um, looking at uh, archaeological reviews, and there's also some potential and actual species at risk that we know may or may not be in this, in this area. So the ministry is looking at that. So within the regional official plan, the lands are designated green fields, um, all of the lands. But in additional figures in that, in that plan, um, specific portions, are, which are shown here in green, sorry for the quality, um, are designated <coughs> core environmental features. So those lands are made up of the environmentally sensitive policy area 80, provincially significant wetlands, regionally significant woodlands. Um, the ROP does have policies around um, certain types of infrastructure that are permitted in core features. It's subject to an environmental impact statement and um, that identifies the impacts and can demonstrate adequate mitigation measures. I just wanted to show you these are the lands that are within the ESPA uh, 80. So within the city's official plan, the lands that are yellow are low density residential. The lands that are green are designated core natural features. Conservation Drive is considered a major collector road. Beaver Creek is a minor collector. Um, so the applicant for n the Northgate lands has appealed certain aspects of the official plan as it relates to their lands. Um, so staff and the applicant have been working actively to resolve that appeal, and the application is being reviewed based on the council-adopted official plan with some consideration given to um, the, um, the language and the policies that have been negotiated to date. In 2015, um, the city did complete um, the Beaver Creek Meadows District Plan for this area. Sorry, that's when that's when the plan was approved. It provides a finer level of detail with respect to roads, land uses, height and densities, location of parks and other facilities. 
Um, at that time, there was also an EA that was completed to assess the overall infrastructure needs for this area, so both servicing and roads um, and stormwater. So within the district plan, the subject lands are categorized as low density residential one, low density residential two, um, mixed use medium density residential, and um, there's also the natural system that's this dark green, there's parks, and there's also um, some municipal facilities. So it's, it's fairly specific, but um, at the same time, there's, there's some room here for um, finer details that are worked out at this stage. Um, these are considered neighborhoods five, six, and seven, and they're specific, uh, or there's, I should say, there's sort of density and targets and unit yield mixes that are described in the district plan. Um, I'll just, I think I'm going to skip over this one, but this is basically just the natural systems for the area. Um, the district plan also looks at a network of trails and pedestrian connections that would, um, could run through this, this area, both on street and within the buffer of the natural system. And it also includes a, a potential crossing in this location that would cross, that would cross through the, um, the core feature. Um, so it, it is staff's desire um, to see this network implemented through these applications. The lands are also, as I said, heavily regulated by the Grand River Conservation Authority. There's two water courses, floodplains, uh, protected wetlands, um, and all of the lands, with the exception of some of these small areas here, the, the lands are all regulated in, by the Grand River Conservation Authority. So in 2013, Council approved a North Waterloo Scope subwatershed study. Through that study, the natural features were classified, their limits were identified. Um, I think I mentioned them before. We've got provincially significant wetlands, regionally significant woodlands. Um, there's, they had, the plan also identified the buffers that were appropriate around those features. Um, there's also the creeks, there's a hedgerow, and then there's the regions environment. Um, ESPA 80. Um, that study also identified uh, called the future study area in this location anticipating that uh, the landowner might in the future come forward looking to um, extend a road connection through there to give, gain, gain access to the agricultural clearing. So um, in 2016 there were terms of reference for that anticipated EIS that were um, that were approved. Uh, I just want to identify a, a, some concurrent uh, projects that are going on in this area that are outside of the limits of the, of the applications. So we've got the reconstruction of Beaver Creek Road and Conservation Drive. It will probably commence in 2018 in, um, at the south end in this location of um, Beaver Creek Road. It'll, they'll work their way up towards what will be a roundabout at the intersection around 2019 and then in 2020 they'll uh, probably be looking at extending, um, doing the upgrades on the west side of the environmental lands. Um, there's also a multi-use trail that's proposed along Conservation Drive. Um, the city also had Stantec conduct a, a turn lane warrant analysis for this section of road that was based on the proposed connections in these locations. And they did determine the need for westbound left turn lanes um, at, at these two points, uh, coupled with a pedestrian uh, refuge island. And at this point, this access would be um, a right in, right out because of its proximity to the roundabout. There's also a uh, community stormwater management facility study that is um, has been initiated by the developer group for this area. Um, they wanted to see if there was a more consolidated approach to dealing with stormwater management. Um, <coughs> so with the consent of this landowner here, um, they're assessing the feasibility and design of, of that facility. Um, so it would ultimately be a city-owned facility, um, and the completion operation of it would ultimately have to dove dovetail with um, the staging and um, registration of certain phases of these, these plans. 
So the applicant has submitted a number of studies. I've, I've listed them here. Um, we're currently reviewing these studies in detail. The applicant also undertook uh, an EIS that was based on those approved terms of reference. Uh, the EIS is under review by the city and the region's environmental planners and also um, EAC, the region's appointed ecological and environmental advisory committee. The study verified the limits of the features that were identified in the scope watershed study. Um, I've just shown this map here. It gives you a sense of where the significant wetlands versus the woodlands are. Um, it, it also looked at impacts to wildlife, erosion and sedimentation, changes to groundwater, and encroachment into um, buffers, which is the primary um, measure you, they're proposing to mitigate impacts to those uh, protected features. Um, they also specifically looked at the impacts of putting a road connection in this location. Um, they looked at where that drip, the drip, the drip line of the woodland is located. They proposed basically a 10 meter buffer off the that drip line, which is comes from the scoped um, subwatershed study. And the road and the infrastructure is intended to be kept outside of the the buffer. So we already know that um, there are a few. Um, uh, areas that the EIS uh, should really go back and address. Um, one of them EAC identified as being consideration of the ecological implications of restoring the agricultural field and as an alternative to um, residential development. So that has come up. Um, I know that'll come up tonight, so I, I just wanted to make note that I, I'm aware of that. Um, so they will have to go back and do that. There may be other things that the EIS, an, an addendum to the EIS should capture. Potential further review um, of the increased volume of surface water that's going to be created as a result of developing these lands and what does that do to, some, to the wetland feature. Um, we also want them to take a closer look at the impact that trail, a trail network in the buffers is going to have and even uh, what kind of impact a crossing through the wetland could have as well. So this is the proposed stewardship plan that, that was included in the EIS. Um, you can see the core feature is sort of that green color. The buffers are beige and it, 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 it also identifies some of the interior forest habitats, that purple color. So there are some areas beside the buffers that are proposing to be naturalized, but then they're also recommending an ongoing monitoring program um, within the core features. Some of the aspects of the applications we're going to look more closely at and we, we may have concerns with or we, we want more information on, um, particularly the fact that those environmental lands and buffers have been excluded from the draft plan. So, um, and they're to be held in private ownership where our standard practice and our preference is really to include them in the draft plan and the city would take ownership of those lands. Um, I won't read through all of this, but uh, expanding the active transportation network beyond what was proposed initially um, is something we want to look more closely at. Um, whether or not we're satisfied with their parkland approach, um, they currently aren't providing all of the their park lane requirement in the way of land so we may look at whether or not we want more park land in these subdivisions and um, another sort of interesting one is the length of that cul-de-sac that's proposed into the agricultural clearing so we we do have some questions around water quality when you get a service that's that long um, and pressure and then there's also looking at fire response and whether these areas should have you know alarm systems and things like that um, so where do we go from here so we're looking at consolidating all of our staff comments and providing those to the um, to the project team who are here tonight and will there may be further submissions or uh, of information potential modifications to that plan the draft plan and the proposed zoning schedule um, we are looking at having a second uh, neighborhood meeting that looks that involves the other active subdivision applications in this in this area so we'll be looking at doing that in the new year 
and then we'll come back to council with uh, a staff report and recommendations and uh, just reminding council that council obviously has the approval authority for the zoning bylaw but um, is the commenting agency on the draft plan of subdivision in the regions the ultimate approval authority so I'd be happy to answer any questions thank you Laura uh, does any council have any questions for staff please remember this is an informal public meeting and only questions of clarification may be asked council members should not express any opinions at this point first up Councillor Whaley thank you mayor uh, I have a couple of questions for you Ms. Dewar is it my understanding that there are three uh, informal public meetings tonight and you've just rolled them into one presentation there's, there's Um, presentation for the third okay zone change subdivision application so um, I, I, I do have a couple questions uh, as you know this is these are some of the last developable lands in our community and our, our community be completely built out after this so we have to get this last one right we got to nail this one it's so important for our future and it's a big it's a big uh, number of people moving in here and we will be in the thousands it's hard to imagine but it's true when you look at those fields uh, so the, uh, the area that is referred to as the hole in the donut so I have a couple of questions around that earlier you showed a couple of slides on core environmental core environmental features it was earlier on uh, and it's uh, if you well well into the uh, mm -hmm. pick any one of these pick any one. that one's fine yep. the last one's fine so th this one's fine perfect so we see the hole in the donut it's essentially surrounded by by um, green uh, green on the picture long way from the uh, conservation drive or Beaver Creek Road and you know we worry about an access road I mean there's lots of questions around uh, the hole in the donut we'll probably be talking about it for weeks but for the for the for the purposes of this application for uh, my question uh, how do we cut through the all the green space to get to that to that the so-called so developable space in the middle through you mayor Jaworski that's really what the EIS is is driving down to um, so no decisions have been made yet we have to do a no study decisions. right I say but cutting through if you will is the um, regional ESPA 80 so um, they have they have shown this drip line and then they've shown buffers and then they're showing the connection within outside of that buffer and I think if the region believes that that can be done in a way that um, depending on the the what what the impact is whether they're satisfied the impact can be mitigated they um, they may have a, a case next to the that are identified as residential so taking a look at the map it's so unusual that a, uh, an agricultural piece of uh, land would be right in the middle of uh, essentially a forest uh, so is does any historical context of the land matter and what what the land was before does that matter in with respect to to future use that's a through you mayor Jaworski that that's a good question um, I mean their agricultural lands as I think I think ultimately we need to we need to see that most of the greenfield lands that are left in the city are, are agricultural um, and so I think if you if you apply one philosophy to to an air, to this area if you apply that philosophy to this area that this is acceptable to develop but not this um, you have to be able to demonstrate why Mr. Carter are you going to comment on this or through you Mayor Jaworski Councillor Whaley um, the historical use of the property does have a bearing on some of the study that's undertaken so when we are looking at environmental impact statements for example 
we do look to determine you know historical uses on the property and see how they've been modified so there is an element of an element of our review that does look back in time if you will thank you that's going to be good for all of us to understand going forward thank you next up is councillor reith then councillor burke Thank you, through you, Mayor Jaworski. Thank you, Laura. Um, my question is about you, uh, one of your last slides there about the pub, the next meeting number two. Um, so, um, led meeting, or will that be led by developer or or what? Because I, the only public meeting that I know of was one that. The city wasn't in, wasn't aware of, or wasn't, um, it wasn't right. even running. So right. I just wondered about the second. You're, you called it the second public meeting. Whether this could be a city-driven meeting? I think it'd be more of a joint, um, jointly hosted, if you will, um, meeting. When we have it. Um, the applicants in this case and the applicants to the for the subdivision to the north Matami, the Matami cook subdivision they will have had an opportunity to have uh, an initial neighborhood meeting so this will be the second staff will have had an opportunity to do an extensive amount of review of the development application and uh, I think it makes sense to have it as more of a jointly hosted meeting and when do you think to really um, review all the comments, have those important discussions with staff, look at whether they want to make uh, any changes to the plan, and then go, I think at that point, um, have a meeting that shows what a, maybe a slightly modified plan looks like that is maybe in response to some of staff's comments, which is the case with the Cook Madame subdivision. They, they have, uh, my understanding is, They've received comments. They are looking at some um, was presented in September. And just one more thing. I just wondered if it would be possible for the notices to go out farther than than they have been. Like, is it 250 meters or I don't know something like that? Be because there's no there's not a lot of people that live in this area but the people mm -hmm. that live mm -hmm. adjacent to this newly developed area are very interested in this development so I know what our policy is but I was just wondering if it would be possible to extend mm -hmm. the invitation to a one probably makes sense to capture some of the residential neighborhoods in a better way that that are nearby um, and not just restricted to that 120 meters. We're also um, now circulating um, Julie Legg, who is the Neighborhood Association Coordinator. So she will get notices of these meetings and neighborhood meetings and will circulate to those as associations and get that word out. Thank you. Next up, Councillor Burke. Um, I think this, this gets interest in a way because it seems like such an unusual there was nothing but corn stalks there and when I moved into Clare Hills it was the same thing here we have this for some reason that none of us seem to know this hole in the middle of a forest is it an unusual situation I believe that it is um, in speaking with uh, I think Joel Joel has more history on, on you know we'll, we'll hear some history from Joel go ahead <laughs> do you Mayor Jaworski to Councillor Burke um, I would say it is not a common situation that the city experiences. Um, we do have our land. There are a few instances in the city, um, one up by Rim Park, for example, where we have a similar situation. Mm -hmm. And again, our approach to it is, is to review the environmental information in a careful and thoughtful way and, and have a look at uh, the context and the development implications of, of potentially um, using those lands for some purpose that they weren't either historically used for or currently used for. 
but it's not a very common uh, situation to have lands like this that are um, so surrounded by environmental environmental uh, uh, lands. This area, for whatever reason, do we know when that happened? Uh, I ha I don't know exactly precisely when it the the germ of this the germation of this but i do know i've looked back at almost a hundred years ago aerial imagery i really zoomed in i used looked at the um, u of w um, aerial archives so i think it's existed for about a hundred years <laughs> and um, in looking at the uh, archaeological review i mean you know they did find a, they found an actually a, an arrowhead. They didn't de determine. So it's it's been this it, way for as long as even maybe Councillor Whaley remembers. <laughs> yeah, very long time. The aerial <laughs> imagery. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, I don't have any further. Oh, Council Freeman, go ahead, and Council Henry. I guess one of the questions that I wondered about was, so this plan identifies the ESPA area, and so is the boundary of the ESPA? If I just jump forward, um, actually, I'm, so this is this is one of the schedules from the subwatershed study. So I think that it, I think they always anticipated that eventually there was going to be a proposal to um, create, create a, a formal access point back into those lands. Does that answer your question? Uh, I, kind of. I guess I'm just literally trying to understand the boundary of the ESPA because mm. wouldn't it have actually been grant like issued a boundary as we have mm -hmm. elsewhere? Yeah, the ESPA. I did. Sh I, sh I think I'll, I can show it to you again here. That's See, that's the limit of the ESPA. So the the ESPA does extend over that yes, parcel. It does. And I guess what I'm it will be helpful for me to better understand at some point whether it's in the environmental impact statement or in a future report to understand what are the and how can those policies be modified or can they be modified and, and that will be helpful for me to understand that the um, the other question I had was when you brought the draft plans to the WACAT committee, so the Waterloo Active Transportation Committee, they had a number of comments mm -hmm. um, that I thought were quite salient to the application um, related to the Active Transportation Network and um, garnering ownership of those lands so the city can um, maintain them, operate registry do those have to happen here at this informal meeting do they have to be asked by a member of council or do they go into a process such that they'll be acted upon through you mayor Jaworski those comments are will form part of part of the the city's comments to the applicant um, so they'll form part of a part of a like a basically a record that could be um, I guess someone could. We've we've discussed this. I think what we want to do. So those comments would be included in there, and we obviously want the um, project team to have an opportunity to see them first, and then we we would be willing to share comments with the public. So those com the WACAT, um motions would be will be verbatim included within my staff comments and I just can you help me to understand like process so um, based on what we hear tonight at this
so they could consider making changes to their application is that right I wouldn't do it in the form of a report I would likely do it in the form of a letter that summarizes all of the all of the comments and then they have that they have a document um, they'll be able to work through those comments and meet with us if they have if, if they want to discuss anything and we'll ultimately be awaiting some sort of uh, resubmission of certain version of the draft plan and the zoning um, uh, schedule so that's what we would expect next I I don't is it if it's possible for council to be cc'd on that letter can you let me know because I don't know what was discussed at other advisory committees of council and given how important this mm -hmm. parcel is and like councillor Whaley said it's one of the last um, inform my future questions I, I think we can do that yeah thank you next up council Henry please thank you mayor and thank you Laura and team for work ahead that uh, that will happen and, and work today I, I know our, our internal comments uh, lots of folks have already spent some time looking at these uh, the ESPA uh, here would be the region um, and that our our role as well on the subdivision elements is as a commenting agency can I infer from that that we can be considered by the region to be a commenter on their analysis of the ESPA AD as well uh, of, of the the infrastructure question through there if there's um if there's things that this that this council wants request comments uh, I think equally we can share the region's comments as well and um, there it's it's a dialogue where it's an ongoing dialogue um, we also want to um, coordinate our comments as much as possible we don't want to be on different pages on this application so we're going to be cross-referencing our comments and their comments so that is a step we're going to take before we actually um, have a finished consolidated document of all of the cities and the terms of I comments just see, I just see mr. Rapp has his hand up well certainly through your merge Worski to councillor Henry ultimately uh, council uh, can bring forward or they comment formally to the region through their resolutions at the time of the formal public hearing in giving forward a request that the region approve as modified deny or various conditions uh, that they would request the region to implement or not that's ultimately the say the, the dovetailing of, of com that makes sense it, it it wouldn't help I think anybody for for the city and, and regional environmental staff to find themselves on different pages yeah. um, but I guess I'm just looking trying to understand sequence uh, as I uh, in in terms of when the region would make that decision and determination in relation to the decisions made with respect to the zone change and you know our forwarding of comments on the subdivision approval does, does that question make sense uh, through Mary Jaworski to Councillor Henry all information that uh, we receive in the various forms we can uh, take forward to the region and share that with the region and then ultimately it would be regional staff and regional EAC that would determine how much weight to give 
any of that information that we've provided to them. So we can do that most certainly if that helps. Okay, thank you. Um, Laura, I'm wondering if you can scroll forward to, I think your third last slide, which was the one with so many bullets. Um, certainly are, are a lot of, are a lot of bullets. I, I've been sort of organizing my head around questions and I see a few of them on, on this sheet. So I'm, I'm glad to see that. Um, and I note under you know, the environmental impact study, you've got a, a note here around salt. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if staff can speak a bit more to that. The way I understand that is that the applicant is proposing as a way of reducing runoff through that infrastructure in the ESPA and in the subdivision, it's to provide a permeable paved road. Right. Um, are, is that part of where that, that issue is coming from? Because I, I know, you know salt and yep. salt finds its way in our, in our wells far too often and, uh, and what we're trying to deal with mitigation on those. So is that, is that where the salt comment is coming from? Yes. Uh, and, and do you think we would have a, uh, a different view on that if we were the ones providing you know, road clearing rather than a condominium corporation? Might, might that be a factor in... Because I, I, I know, you know Cam's got his teams mm -hmm. you know, you know, GISing and, and, and tracing every last bit of sodium that drops onto, uh, onto our roadways. But I, I know the contractor that my condominium corporation uh, uses uh, is a bit more liberal in some places on, on some of that. So I, I'm wondering if we might have a different view on, on, on who does that uh, in terms of its impact or, or whether that's not a factor. We do want to sort out how to... Um, manage some of those practices and we have ways of doing that um, but we do in a more at a more at a higher level we want to understand uh, how possible salting of the road could impact um, the Mission. We just want a little bit. We want to drive down to a little more detail. Um, that was a. That's a comment I know that's come from our engineering staff. So um, I can't speak to it in a lot more detail than that. But we we we're on we're on it. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I remember reading in the uh, uh, the EIS the the line around sort of road pollutants uh, because there aren't very many vehicles traveling. But I. Uh, the, the salt content doesn't seem to me to be related to the number of vehicles traveling. It's related to the need to salt a road. So I appreciate that. Um, going down a couple in terms of minimizing needs for retaining walls, I also and, and there appeared to me to be a fairly steep grade uh, uh, over over a distance on the south side of that, requiring a, a retaining wall. Is it, are those the retaining walls, or are there others throughout the site that? We're also interested in looking at. I, I believe that was the only one shown on the plans that were submitted, but um, we we have noted in a few areas that there's a certain vertical separation that I understand in speaking with the engineering staff we want to maintain across the subdivision with between the We may need to uh, create more vertical separation than is than is currently shown on a very preliminary grading plan. So, when you, we want to make sure that this site is graded. Um, we know that the grading works across the whole subdivision in such a way that minimizes the need for these retaining walls, and we're not sort of leaving it to the site plan stage. And and now we didn't look at it in that level of detail, and we could have graded everything a little bit differently and not necessarily needed the um where those trails would be located so we want to we want to drive down at this point a little bit further into how those trails would be built and would they need retaining walls and if they need retaining walls does are they you know, we want to make sure they're not needing to go into the buffer. And then there's obviously some impacts that could, can come out of that. So that's why I say we want to, generally speaking, we want to avoid those if we can um, by refining the grading point. Uh, 
and I mean, you've, you've got Parkland dedication on there, and you mentioned the deficiency on there. That's something I'm certainly very interested in, in seeing, and I'll ask the applicant why uh, deficient Parkland dedication uh, allocation is okay, uh, and, uh, and I'll look for that more. Uh, in reports. I know the other thing that I, I didn't see on this list, although it might be under one of these words in, in terms of technical details, is the low impact you know, development in terms of water retention and, and, and other features that uh, the applicant is proposing. I, I'm wondering if, uh, if, if we have a typical approach to who owns those ultimately and whether we've had uh, experience on how well they're maintained if they're owned by um, different parties, uh, people other than, uh, other than the city. I would look into that a little further for you. Um, I think that is a concern that the engineering staff have is So we want to make sure that chats with our engineering folks as, as well on that and I think the other you know I thought that I'd, I'd, I'd raise it's not sort of an opinion on the application but a, a general thought on these kinds of measures when they are owned by private landowners is we, we do have a stormwater credit program that in many cases is underused and I wonder about um, when those are connected early on in a, in a process, if a resident knows when they're buying a parcel of land that it comes with these features they have to maintain and they get a credit uh, right off the beginning, they may or may not be more likely to maintain it and, and be aware or not. In, in, in some places as, as well. So I think that there may be two different edges to, to that sword, but I think it's something worth, worth exploring and thinking about both internally and externally on, on making sure that if, if those are a function of, of water balance, that they're maintained in the long run and not just built. So I'll leave it there for now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Laura. I'll now ask the registered delegations to come forward, of which we have six. First up, Dave Aston, now HBC Planning. Welcome, Dave. Hey, Mayor Jaworski, thanks for the opportunity to speak this evening. I just want to introduce, we brought along our team in case there are any detailed questions that I can't answer. Uh, Jeff Martins with MT Consultants, Elaine Gosnell with NRSI, our environmental consultants, Jim Mallett from Paradigm Transportation, and uh, Paul Britton, uh, from our office as well. So uh, we've been working as a team uh, for a number of years now in pulling together the submission. And I think, uh, first of all, I want to thank Ms. Dewar for her presentation. It really cut a lot out of my presentation, so I'll try and focus in on and, and maybe get to some answers on some of the questions where I can. And also want to uh, say thanks to her for really answering all the questions that she did. Um, as she had mentioned, the application has been submitted. It's been into agency circulation, and we're just starting to get comments back. And part of tonight is also to receive feedback from the public. So um, I think she did a great job in responding to the number of questions uh, where we're at in the process, which really is at the, the beginning of the process. And uh, also want to acknowledge her comment and, and the question of Councillor Reith that uh, follow up um, consolidated neighborhood meeting uh, would occur so that uh, we can share the information from the agencies and, and city staff um, as it relates to this plan, uh, the, the other Activa plan that you hear from tonight, and other plans in the area. So there's a, there's a good picture of what's happening out there. Um, I would say that uh, in response to this being one of the last remaining greenfield areas, um, Understanding that has been important from staff's perspective from the start of this entire process back to um, in the early 2000s as part of the North Waterloo Scopes of Watershed study. So there's been a lot of work put into understanding the area, uh, getting a sense of the issues, getting a sense of you know, areas for development, not development, how the area will be planned, how the area will be serviced. So a lot of work has gone into that and that kind of evolved into the Beaver Creek Meadows District plan that staff 
again, put a lot of effort into uh, to prepare and to bring forward, and that was adopted by Council. So where we are tonight in discussing subdivisions and zone changes really starts to get into implementing, I would say, nearly a decade of planning work and uh, kind of working together on the details and, and how do those policies and that framework of land uses, how do they get implemented uh, through these detailed processes. Um, so here's the site. Uh, Ms. Dewar provided an overview. There's two applications that we're speaking to uh, this evening or two, two lands under application. Uh, draft plan of subdivision zoning bylaw amendment and then as mentioned draft plan of vacant land condominium which uh, is essentially the creation of lots on a private condominium road and we'll be dealing with that uh, as well through the process. Uh, this just provides a general idea, a, a kind of a colored version of the draft plan. Uh, we call it a neighborhood plan. It gives you some context to uh, what will be happening in the area, identifies parks and the stormwater management facilities, generally the uh, natural features. Uh, really is going to be uh, a, a neighborhood uh, within the broader community as well. Um, local roads and, and private roads, and really there'll be a mix of uh, various uh, types of dwelling units, single detached dwelling units, larger uh, single detached dwelling units, townhouses, cluster townhouses, stack townhouses, and uh, provision for something mid-rise. So we're really working to uh, follow what the district plan was saying and recognizing the opportunity to create a complete community in this area and provide for a range and mix of housing. <coughs> um, this is really just the detailed draft plan of subdivision that we submit. Um, just wanted to point out a couple things. Uh, so this pumping station that was referred to that is on uh, the west side of Beaver Creek serves uh, the lands on the west side of Beaver Creek under this application. It's also the pumping station that is providing service for lands further to the west along Conservation Drive. And so that's something that was identified in uh, the Class EA that was completed by the city. Uh, the other pumping station, which is located down here, uh, is servicing the east side of these lands. And it's also servicing lands that are, uh, well, the Madame Cook lands and the Activa lands and the future development of the uh, trailer park. So two major pieces of infrastructure on the plan servicing broader community uh, area. Uh, some of the details as far as the plan and the parkland area. Um, the idea with the parkland area was to provide parkland uh, and then the the deficiency to provide in cash in lieu or to work with the city in finding opportunity to have those parks designed and built up front in the community so that they're, uh, they're established early on in the community. So that's part of the rationale as it relates to parkland dedication. Um, the road widenings and details associated with infrastructure are, are identified on the plan. Uh, that's falling out of the details associated with the class environmental assessment. And you can see the density range there uh, falling within the density range uh, that was established through the Beaver Creek Meadows District Plan and then subsequently an official plan amendment. Um, the proposed zoning, uh, Ms. Stewart covered this. Uh, I don't really intend to speak too much more. Um, as far as the triple zoned block, um, I think there may be a way to, uh, to uh, better zone that so that it's a, uh, a little easier to work with. So we'll be working with staff on that and then also working with staff on uh, some of the zoning and site specific provisions. Uh, many of the site specific provisions uh, relate to uh, newer building forms uh, opportunity to achieve um, density that's required and providing different housing choice opportunities. Ms. Dewar uh, mentioned back-to-back -back townhouses. There's also stacked townhouses. So really to capture different types of, uh, of housing that's in the market. 
Uh, the regional official plan um, point that I just want to make here is there was some question and discussion. Uh, the regional official plan, uh, the bottom identifies the core greenlands. Um, there's policy within the regional official plan that allows for the provision of infrastructure through core greenlands subject to the completion of an EIS. And this policy is something that we work through with regional staff as part of uh, the regional official plan. And it speaks to infrastructure associated with services and includes uh, roads, which would include private roads. So there's provision within the regional plan for a consideration of that infrastructure subject to the EIS, which has been submitted and is under review. Uh, the City of Waterloo official plan, uh, again, generally the lands are, are designated residential. Uh, the open space area reflects uh, the core greenlands um, from the regional official plan. Uh, what I would note is as it relates to the um, residential area within uh, the ESPA, or surrounded by the ESPA, is that that designation uh, was also residential in the previous City of Waterloo official plan. So it's been designated previous, you went through a new official plan, it continued to be designated residential. So historically that's been uh, the designation of the lands. Um, the North Waterloo Scoped Watershed Study, the plan on the top left, uh, Ms. Dewar referenced, uh, that was uh, the natural system plan. Uh, so the North Subwatershed uh, Study was adopted by council uh, with a lot of work uh, done with city staff, regional staff, and uh, acknowledgement to some of the residents who were also part of that group that I, I know are here this evening. Uh, so there's a lot of work done uh, with that study um, that study recommended buffers and setbacks and what could happen within buffers and then identified uh, that area of future study uh, related to the clearing to the field uh, subject to an EIS. So the sub-watershed study again established the framework for the district plan which then has been used as, uh, as a basis for the draft plans. Just want to point out in the sub-watershed study there is also an implementation plan um, so that plan identified areas for phasing based on the provision of, of infrastructure. Uh, and so these lands are within phase one and phase two, and that infrastructure primarily relates to the pumping stations and stormwater management ponds um, and roads. Uh, the Beaver Creek Meadows District Plan uh, just to note that there was a special policy as part of that plan that also um, identified the area uh, for access to uh, the residential area and the need for a environmental study. So that has continued through the planning uh, stages and now we're at the point where we're, that analysis has been done from our perspective, submitted to the city and the region and we're into agency review and we'll be working through that process. This plan is uh, somewhat confusing, but the attempt here was to overlay the draft plan of subdivision with the Beaver Creek Meadows district plan. And I would suggest it's substantially in compliance with the district plan. A few variations, one, uh, the distribution of parks, which I'll speak to, I have another slide on that. Uh, the stormwater management facility, which Ms. Stewart mentioned, the idea of a consolidated stormwater management facility on the uh, trailer park lands, which actually was uh, something discussed very early on uh, with the subwatershed study. And then just some minor changes to the local road pattern to reflect different unit types, um, but trying to achieve the same intent. For example, on the east side, there's Beaver Creek Road, and you'll see that the district plan identified what I'll call window streets. Well, we've looked at that as a multiple residential block where we think we can achieve a design with units fronting the street without the need for a window street. So achieving the same design objective just through a different uh, design approach. Uh, with regard to parks, um, when we looked at the district plan and the location of parks, uh, what we notice is 
there was a large park uh, in this area which was somewhat tucked in behind the residential area so we wanted to keep that park as uh, really a connection for the trail system and it could be a passive uh, location for benches or, or trailheads but we thought to better distribute the park central to this portion of the neighborhood to provide a larger central park that could provide more active space for the neighborhood. Uh, so that's the, the proposed change or variation from the district plan. Um, we've done preliminary park designs. You can see them uh, here, uh, open field area, play structure area. Uh, and then on the east side of Beaver Creek, uh, the park really forms a bit of a transition from the mixed use node or the higher density area uh, down into the townhouses and as the density um, uh, decreases and that also will provide a connection through to the trail. Uh, so again that park uh, similar uh, a bit of a trail through it, a play area, seating area. So uh, we're, we're looking to distribute the parks equally across the entire uh, site. within. Uh, each what I'll call multiple block area there'll also be the need for consideration of amenity areas so I think with the way the parks are located other amenity areas within pri or private amenity areas there'll be good coverage for uh, parks and amenity space for residents uh, this is just a broad overview of uh, uh, open space and trails and uh, we'll be working with the city on on implementation of trails and where best to cross the creek and, and we'll work through those details uh, with city staff. Um, we wanted to kind of give some idea of some of the thinking around development uh, within the central field. Um, the EIS speaks to a number of considerations. Uh, the intent of this slide is to pick up on a few of them. Uh, from the top, there's additional open space area. So we've identified through zoning additional area that would be set aside for open space um, that would increase the depth of the corridor, the green space, and create additional interior habitat. Uh, the design uh, respects the uh, environmental limits that were established within the subwatershed study. So the area shown there. Uh, proposed for the development is, is entirely outside of the buffers uh, that were established in the subwatershed study. Um, there's been a lot of thought given to opportunities for low impact development and design considerations associated with that, um, uh, including a, that, that central green would be a landscaped area and bioswale feature associated with stormwater management. There's some discussion already about permeable uh, pavement. Um, so we're looking for ways, or we've looked at ways for low impact <coughs> development. Uh, there will be larger lots within that area, and that really is a function of the need to consider the number of lots permitted on one street. Uh, there's a policy that relates to 26 units on one access. So as you count from here, um, along there's a total of 26 units uh, so um, that will kind of govern the number of units within uh, that area uh, with regard to the private road um, the intent there is is to have a modified design to look to reduce the amount of asphalt or pavement within that area um, private road and and it was mentioned uh, by Councillor Henry about consideration of salt um, that was one of the considerations in looking at a modified road design there uh, there's also consideration given to uh, movement of uh, of animals in in the form of culverts and and other mitigation in consideration of that private road so there's a full analysis associated with the road and uh, development associated with uh, that central field. Uh, Ms. Dewar covered the technical studies, all of which are currently under review. Um, these um, are, we're also subject to uh, discussion and input as part of the pre-application process and uh, the, the, traffic, uh, so the traffic 
um, information came from city staff, as Ms. Stewart suggested, with regard to uh, the Class EA or, or uh, the left turn lane analysis. Uh, archaeological assessment's been completed. Uh, that was submitted to the ministry, and we do have confirmation back that there's no uh, concerns with that. Um, so these studies are, were completed uh, based on you know, the experience of the professionals and through discussions with city or regional staff to uh, look to scope or ensure that the studies uh, met what was required. Just on the uh, environmental impact study, um, again, Ms. Dewar referenced this slide. I just wanted to point out a few things. Um, the subwatershed study spoke to increasing the width or enhancing uh, the width associated with Beaver Creek. If you go out there now and you stand at the road here, you'll see that the width associated with the creek and kind of a buffer or naturalized area is, uh, is quite minimal. It's, there's agricultural plowing right up uh, to really the edge of the banks. So what we've looked at doing is locating, well, the buffers, there's the floodplain, and then stormwater management, and park, and then stormwater management, uh, and additional open space in this area. So we're moving from what I would call a narrow channel to 60 to 100 meters as far as the channel along Beaver Creek. So that was one of the recommendations of the subwatershed study. Uh, one of the other areas that I would note is uh, there's some environmental enhancement associated with the uh, cartway lands. If you, if you look, uh, part of the cartway lands are uh, within the buffer. Uh, so as the cartway lands are removed, uh, that buffer area will then be uh, naturalized or enhanced. So uh, there's some enhancement associated with uh, that as well. Uh, and then there's reference to, as I mentioned earlier, the additional open space areas uh, to assist with creating additional uh, interior forest habitat. Um, functional servicing study, uh, all this to suggest that the lands are uh, planned to be serviced with full municipal services. Uh, Class EA was completed by the city and adopted and that identified the key uh, components of the major infrastructure as highlighted by Ms. Dewar. Internally, internally there will be local infrastructure uh, which has been um, uh, considered and uh, documented through the functional servicing study that's been submitted to the city uh, for review. Uh, the key infrastructure is identified within the city development charges bylaw currently and uh, as Mr. Stewart said, a lot of work is underway uh, to get going with improvements associated with Conservation Drive, Beaver Creek Road, and getting the pumping station, um, the pumping station lands, both pumping stations, uh, ready for construction. Uh, stormwater management, um, the stormwater management report is based on uh, the uh, strategy developed in accordance uh, the strategy developed by the subwatershed study. Uh, so again, that sets the criteria that have been considered. Uh, I mentioned the stormwater management ponds. There's one on the west side of the creek, and then for the east side of the creek is the shared or the consolidated facility. And that's currently within a process with uh, the landowners and city staff as well. Uh, so in summary, uh, the lands are identified uh, within the city urban area, designated for um, growth, uh, designated greenfield area. There's uh, densities established for them. Uh, there's residential designations that speak to uh, providing a range of units. Uh, the open space de designations have been considered in association with the policies that relates to those. Uh, the develop would be based on full municipal services <coughs> and uh, the proposed zoning implements the direction of the Beaver Creek Meadows District Plan. So the subdivision and zoning that has uh, been submitted uh, is a reflection of all the hard work that has uh, been going on over the past years to set the policy framework uh, for these applications to be considered. I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions. 
Thank you very much. Questions for the delegate? I see Councillor Burke and then Councillor Freeman. Yeah, I'm sure you're, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm sure you're aware there are a lot of people who feel differently about that central field and and want it to be, I don't know, renaturalized, whatever you'd like to call it. What do you, I, I'm just curious, in, in, in what do you say to people who feel that way? What's, I guess, for lack of a better term, the justification for doing that, for creating this private place in what I think a lot of people believe is the middle of a forest? Right. Uh, so through you, Mayor Jaworski, um, where we started was the policy framework. Uh, so we looked at the policy framework, which identified designated residential and assessed through the stormwater management study, which identified a developable area, that as a developable area. So that's where we go as far as uh, justification and consideration. We then look at the policies associated with infrastructure and, and consideration for infrastructure uh, within the core greenlands. And then uh, took that, pieced that together, worked with the environmental community that has been submitted uh, for review and ultimately we'll get comments back from the city staff regional staff uh, we'll hear public comments as well and uh, then there'll be further discussion associated with that so the short answer is because you're allowed to at this point well I think the policy framework suggests that it's uh, designated and, and could be developed okay thank you Next up, Councillor Freeman, please. Um, notwithstanding the fact that in looking at the environmental impact statement, um, some of the things associated with what you were saying earlier about the region allows infrastructure associated um, infrastructure and associated infrastructure to go through an ESPA, um, provided that the EIS supports that, the environmental impact statement. So there's a few things in the impact statement. I, you know, I'm not an expert in this area and I haven't read all 150 pages. And hopefully can get some more answers to, or things like how do you mitigate the light pollution through that strip between the area that makes sense to develop and the area that makes less sense to develop. So how do you, I'd like to know how that's being mitigated because the report's very vague. It says lighting designs should include shielding and directional lighting on roads and buildings to avoid light wash impacts on wildlife. But it would appear to me that in that zone, there'd be limited ability to do that. What we know occurs around um, pipe leakage from infrastructure pipes, because it would appear to me that in this area, the potential leakage from uh, storm and sa storm less, but sanitary in particular, into that environmentally sensitive protective area, could be a concern. Um, so I don't I don't understand how you mitigate that, and I don't see that listed in the EIS. Um, the other piece that I'm trying to understand is the whole notion of wildlife crossings because it makes some reference to I think turtle fencing and so on but it's just it's such a huge area and I also don't understand like what's the long-term management of that like um, I know that they're looking for this to be a condominium setup but like, you know, what's the inspection of stuff like that? How often is it maintained? How often is it repaired? How often is it changed? Just all of those aspects, because it, it, it appears to me that it's a big ask. And I'm trying to really understand, you know, 
how how the environment is being <coughs> mitigated in that in that whole thing and the EIS isn't helping me right now um, because of the language like it's a slight impact or it's it's a it's a mild this or mild that the mitigation measures could include this well I need to know what it includes does that mitigation work what are the tools to ensure that it works there's just a lot of information there uh, and I think um, a lot of the information is really information that my senses will need to be responding to uh, we've proposed uh, a mitigation strategy as part of the EIS some of the details would fall out of the more more detailed design uh, should that uh, approach be accepted based on a review of the EIS so I think probably uh, rather than me trying to answer all of the details, I think but my sense is a lot of questions or comments uh, may come out of the review and then uh, give us a chance to consider those comments and see uh, how we need to respond uh, by way of you know, additional information in the environmental impact study. Thank you. Uh, further questions from Council for the delegate? Council Henry. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Dave. Uh, I think you briefly touched on the plan as as such, which was to um, effectively make up the balance through um, providing cash in lieu. Thank you, Mayor. That is correct. Uh, cash in lieu and opportunity to work with the city uh, to to utilize or direct that. Um, directly to the parks so design and construction of the parks could happen early on uh, in in the neighborhood rather than later in the process so that you some comments on as as we go um, I'd note from from my understanding of of you know parkland dedication when we take cash in lieu it's so that we can you know, generally acquire parks in, you know, an area that, you know, is experiencing growth. This area is experiencing growth, so we'd acquire parkland in this area, but it's a plan of subdivision. So I, I'm having difficulty getting my head around that argument, and I'll look forward to, to seeing more detail throughout this plan, then maybe that's an element of, of conversation. I'm not sure. I don't want to preempt where staff are going to go with their comments in a detailed review. Um, so I want to get out of the, I guess if it's a hole in the donut, I want to get out of the 15 units that form the Timbit and, and get into uh, and get into some of the broader uh, you know, subdivision pieces. I did see you flash a, a design on the road from across Conservation Drive in terms of the link up for your phase one and two uh, in terms of that road. And how that to the roundabout um, I'm curious about that decision in your in your draft to move the road over towards the roundabout and and cause some challenges I find it interesting because I haven't seen yet what's going on across the road that hasn't come into documents I've had a chance to see that the applicant across the road is moving to um, and so I will be curious about GRT's comments on on transit serviceability when you start having right in right outs on roads that appeared to me from the district plan would have supported a, a transit network system but I'm curious about, um, one right. uh, through you mayor perhaps I can answer without you know, kind of uh, the antenna shifting in the road and maybe move beyond that a bit because we've had uh, discussions with staff and the developer on the other side of the road uh, and are looking to work with them and, and our understanding is they have a revised plan that identifies the roads aligning so north and south of Conservation Drive um, and that was really the concern from uh, city staff as if there was two roads not aligned
do. But uh, my understanding, and, and as we move through the process, uh, I believe we'll have an answer that uh, the streets on the north and south will align, uh, which will function um, appropriately, and there, there may not be any concerns in that regard as far as movements. No, as that'll be details, we'll get uh, we'll get later. Um, and, and I guess the last question I, I have, I, and this is different, and uh, I, I could have asked it to Ms. Dewar as, as well, but it given it's much closer. Uh, we've we've done some traffic calming work in the area that was contentious. Um, as most traffic calming works are, and part of what this council has said is that we are interested in making sure road networks are designed right from the beginning so we don't have to retrofit them after they're constructed. Maybe I could call that traffic calming by design. Um, I, I'm curious if, in your opinion, and I'll be interested in review, if we feel that the design coming in on Northgate and, and, and concerns about traffic speeds and install a bunch of things people don't like and fill up our chambers again uh, through mr. chair so you is the question of the internal local roads uh, yeah, give consideration? yeah obviously we have to yeah. deal with conservation drive and um, Beaver Creek and I think that's something as far as the design of internal local roads uh, we can work with city staff if there are areas identified through a detailed review that that should give consideration to traffic calming. There's a number of ways to do that. So I think it's probably more of a, a good point and, and hear the point and we'll test uh, on the, uh, the north gate plan. Um, on the west side of the plan, uh, the, what I'll, I'll just pull up. This will work. The, the kind of collector road in a, in a U-shaped pattern uh, in itself provides some relief because there are turn movements and stops there. Um, and on the east side, uh, perhaps it's a good point, maybe there's something, uh, because from conservation down to Beaver Creek is a fairly straight run, uh, perhaps we give some consideration to how we deal with the park and crossing into the trail as far as a, a traffic calming feature, whether it's bumping out the curbs or, or whatever the case may be. That could be, uh, for example, a specific area that we look at. Further questions for the delegate? Seeing none, thank you very much, Dave. Thank you. Rushing along to delegate number two. Next up is Tracy Mann, and welcome, Tracy. And you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. We support to the city's urban forest policy, the opinion of the city's own consultants, and common sense to encourage the city of Waterloo to prioritize the protection of the forest region in the area being considered for rezoning from agricultural <coughs> to residential in the area of Beaver Creek and Conservation Drive. In particular, I'm worried about the impact of a condo development in the agricultural field adjacent to the ESPA 80 and the significant woodland and wetland encompassed there. Well, however, I've lived 20 years. I view this forested area and the lower wood conservation area as precious assets in our area. As an asset, this greatly contributes to making Waterloo a wonderful city, a livable city, an asset that we have a duty to protect. I'm concerned how this development on all sides of the ESPA will threaten to damage and possibly destroy this asset. The city of Waterloo has recognized the value of such an asset in the vision statement contained in the urban forest policy, updated in February the growth of the urban forest. It intends to remain in the forefront of cities, providing a healthy and beautiful urban forest for the benefit of its citizens. The city will endeavor to preserve and protect urban forest canopies as historic features of the city and expand it through a program of proactive planting. 
The city will endeavor to protect woodlands in order to safeguard their ecological, aesthetic, and psychological benefits. Sorry, physiological benefits. The city has unique opportunity to advance this vision through requiring reforestation or naturalization of this inner agriculture in face of challenges to it that will come from the other development in the area. To date, the ESPA has been surrounded by fields and limited traffic impact. The development activity, the changes it brings, Abuse from new residents who are unaware or unconcerned about protecting natural areas will no doubt inflict stress on this ESPA. I am very much in agreement with the City's own consultants in the Beaver Creek Meadows discussion paper that has been referenced tonight. This strongly recommended the rehabilitation of the field to, and I quote, protect the existing natural heritage features, and I quote further, provide a measurable enhancement to an existing core environmental feature. But this unique asset is even more valuable through its proximity to the Laurel Creek Nature Center and the conservation area. As the ESPA and the field are adjacent to Laurel Creek Nature Center, they become an area that can greatly benefit all members of our community through the work of the Laurel Creek Nature Center. My own children have benefited from the many educational opportunities provided by the Laurel Creek Nature Center through school programs and camps. Even just walking through this area gives an opportunity to see and hear a variety of wildlife who are negatively impacted by this development. The knowledge and fauna. This offers the next generation an opportunity to understand the wonder and value of the natural world. They also get an opportunity to experience the mental, mental and physical benefits that come with spending time in the great outdoors. Some children in our community may not have otherwise received these opportunities and experiences in their daily life. Richard Lowe, who wrote the book, The Last Child in the Woods, and the more recent book, The Nature Principle, tells of whole families and how whole communities can become healthier, happier, more connected, and research that demonstrated just after limited hour of interacting with nature, memory performance, and attention span improves by 20%. Swiss researchers have reported that being in a natural setting can reduce depression, reduce blood pressure, and improve physiological well-being. Requiring forestation of, reforestation of this field and protecting the urban forest will ensure the residents of Waterloo, the students of our schools, and future generations can continue to benefit from educational, physical, and psychological benefits of spending time in nature. In contrast, allowing a conti development within this field is completely at opposition with the greater vision we want as a world-class inclusive community. These will no doubt be very expensive, very exclusive lots. Ironically, due to the surrounding forest, the same forest that is put at risk due to this development. There's a risk that the condo owners were unintentionally or intentionally damage the ESPA. I often walk and run through the urban forest in Laurelwood where I find garbage or garden waste dumped which risks introducing invasive so that residents of this area can directly access Beaver Creek Road, instead of having to drive all the way out to Conservation Drive and then to Beaver Creek Road. It is my understanding that access road to this field was already expanded by cutting into the treat area. We saw tonight in the presentation that that is, um, road area is actually part of the ESPA. A road through the SPA to Beaver Creek would bifurcate the forest, hampering movement of wildlife and stressing the forest. Similar, smaller forest areas struggle to maintain themselves against stresses posed by human use and providing deep at forested area, particularly one that is adjacent to the conservation area, we have the opportunity to maintain an emerald gem in our community. Something that is really world class that benefits our entire community, as well as the plants and animals we share the environment with. As noted in the city's urban forest vision, the city's consultants report, we need to seek and protect and enhance our forested area. Adding trees to this field area demonstrates Waterloo's commitment to balancing development and protecting our environment. I'm not asking to limit significant development in North Waterloo.
development, but also our entire community and our ecosystem for generations to come. I want to live in Waterloo that makes wise decisions for the benefits of the entire community and future generations, not just a privileged few who live on a private road. This requires tough decisions to fully achieve the vision we have for our community, both physical community and the health of each of our citizens and the flora and fauna that share our environment. I encourage Waterloo to do the right thing and the common sense thing to require the agricultural field inside the north lobe of the ESPA to be naturalized or reforested. not to be bullied by developers into doing otherwise. I hope to see reflected this, I hope to see this reforested field proudly featured on the Waterloo's um, environmental leadership side in the City of Waterloo's annual report in the future as we saw tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tracy. Uh, any questions for the delegate? Thank you. Well spoken. I do have a question of staff. Uh, I think we're going to have, I, I heard in the presentation that in the, the ESPA is under the jurisdiction of the region and that um, delegates here tonight make it to the region or should they be doing something different with their comments as well? On the assumption that Ken Sealing is not watching us on Rogers Cable 20 right now. In response to your question, Mayor Jaworski, um, we are taking diligent notes and we will convey our notes to the regional staff. We also note that some regional staff are in attendance, or at least were in attendance earlier this evening. So, uh, yeah, we will coordinate with regional staff. Thank you. Oh, uh, Councilor Freeman. Sorry, in that. the individual that prepared this but in the environmental impact assessment <clears throat> there's a number of places that makes reference to trees being cut down and so on um, as overseen by region of Waterloo staff that seems <coughs> contrary to the other information that we've been provided so I think it would be helpful to understand what role the region plays in that like on page 81 it talks about the access road and says that um, that all tree removal staff and it also talks about um, like some very special design requirements of that access road and I I really would need to understand what tools again that that we as a city or the region has to um, to both direct that and to make sure it happens I guess through you Mayor Jaworski to Councillor Freeman um, line all of this information and the tools within Council's tool tools kit uh, to, to address the road um, if it is advanced and staff are supportive from a from a planning perspective uh, ultimately at the end of the day there's certainly a lot of review that needs to occur with respect to this plan of subdivision in many different regards from environmental to engineering to other aspects so we are as Mr. Aston indicated in the early stages of, of this review we haven't formulated any opinion we are still gathering some information um, with respect This ESPA area would uh, be of that size. So any tree removal is subject to regional approval. And if any trees were removed, it is possible that regional um, forestry staff were involved in, in uh, either commenting and directing those tree removals for whatever purpose they were. We will certainly find all the details around that and provide that information to council uh, so you can make effective decisions. Thank you. Uh, next up on our list, delegate is Sean McCammon. Welcome, Sean. Mayor, members of council, thank you for the opportunity to speak here this evening. Uh, my name is Sean McCammon. I work for the Waterloo Region District School Board at the Laurel Creek Nature Center. Uh, I've worked there for 18 years now, teaching students about the importance of forests and wetlands and uh, wildlife. 
And a lot of our programs at Laurel Creek uh, take students into an old growth forest at the north end uh, of our property. And that, that property borders uh, the hole in the donut right here. And one day in 2004, I was out there walking with a class, and I noticed that our neighbor who owns the hole in the donut had buried a wetland right here. Uh, it was a low area that had uh, cattails and frogs in it, and one day he just bulldozed it. And uh, I called the GRCA, and the GRCA sent out uh, staff, and they looked at it and they said we could, in fact, make the developer uh, restore that pond back to the way it was, but they said we're, we're not going to pursue any action at that time. And then in uh, 2005, October 19th, 2005, uh, the same landowner uh, started his farm lane that had access into the hole in the donut. So this is what it used to look like. And uh, a region of Waterloo bylaw officer came out to see the cutting and he put a stop work order on the logging. And he told me, this, this is really bad. I'm gonna bring back my supervisor tomorrow. And so the next day they came back <coughs> and the landowner had continued cutting and they dug up all the stumps and they dug a hole in the ESPA and they buried the stumps in the ESPA. And so this is, this is what was left. Um, all the trees that were cut were part of the ESPA and uh, in the end the landowner had made his own uh, road that was 115 feet wide uh, through, the, through the protected area. And so that's, that's what we're looking at now when we see that corridor into the hole in the donut. And the developer, <coughs> the developer says that you know, nothing illegal happened here. And it's true that he was never charged with, with anything. Uh, but nobody from the region issued any permit for anybody to make their own road uh, through the ESPA. Um, and as a slap on the wrist for doing this, the, the, the region banned the landowner from cutting trees on his property for one year. That, that was the punishment. And it's very discouraging for citizens concerned about the environment that, you know, uh, environmental protections are not upheld by our <coughs> municipal organizations. That someone can bury a wetland or make a road through a protected forest and nobody does anything. There, there are no repercussions. And uh, because the landowner now has, re has removed all the environmental impediments to development, you know, we're now considering building uh, condominiums in the middle of a protected forest. And if you can swallow this one, the landowner is arguing that this corridor should no longer be considered part of the ESPA because there are no longer any trees growing on it. Uh, you know, there's a lot of environmental impacts that this development would have. There'd be runoff into the creeks, there'd be impacts on wildlife, spread of invasive species, loss of biodiversity, all that kind of stuff. But really, if the environment actually plays a role in decision making, uh, you know, this picture is all that you need. Uh, we, we have an environmentally sensitive forest that at some point in history has had a tart cut out here, and we need to decide whether that hole should have condos in it or trees. And uh, when the Beaver Creek Meadows District Plan was passed by City Council in January of last year, uh, this is what it said could happen in that hole in the donut. Uh, land use could include residential use, open space, or a restoration area. And the Beaver Creek Meadows District Plan was not an approval of development in that field. Uh, there were three options to be considered. The environmental impact statement paid for by the developer only considered one of these options and of course recommended development. Uh, a different consulting company hired by the city in 2015 uh, recommended restoration, strongly re recommended restoration. And so uh, the city of Waterloo has an environment first policy which aims to enhance natural areas and increase canopy cover. And here's a goal in the city of Waterloo strategic plan that says we are all stewards of the environment, acting now by preserving the natural environment, reducing our carbon footprint, and building the city in an environmentally sound manner will benefit future generations. Sounds pretty good. Uh, we have here an amazing opportunity to create interior forests 
where natural systems can keep functioning the way we need them to. Uh, we don't have many areas like this in Waterloo. If the hole in the donut were filled in with trees, the entire forest would be as big as Stam Woodlot. Uh, the forest would be twice as big as the forest in Bechtel Park <coughs> if that area were restored. And all along in this process, you know, I never, I never really believed we'd get to this point. You know, I thought, you know, even though the landowner had got away with some egregious environmental actions, uh, all of these decision makers were aware of this. And, you know, I didn't think they'd really let someone, you know, profit from acts like this. And, you know, I, I, I felt that at some point somebody from either the region or the city or the GRC or somebody would stand up and say, you know, this is not an environmentally appropriate area to build uh, condominiums. Let's just put this to rest and deal with the rest of the Beaver Creek plan. Uh, but that hasn't happened yet. And everyone in this process seems to defer to either someone else and uh, another organization or they point to the environmental impact statement or the Places to Grow Act or the North Waterloo Scope Sub-Watershed Study. But none of these documents restricts planting trees in the field. And even though the field was designated as residential 25 years ago, uh, having it designated as residential does not mean you can't plant trees in there. You can still plant trees in that field even though it's designated as residential. And, you know, Everyone in this process, you know, knows this map. <coughs> they can picture this field. And what is being considered here seems like a straightforward decision. You have <coughs> a field surrounded by an environmentally sensitive forest with Laurel Creek flowing through one side, Beaver Creek flowing through the other, beside a conservation area where students go to learn about nature. And we need to decide whether that should be condos or trees. And it seems, you know, fairly straightforward. Um, if the decision to be made here reflected the will of the citizens of Waterloo, uh, we would certainly be planting trees instead of considering uh, putting in a gated community for maybe maybe only a hundred people. Um, I know this 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 process uh, is skewed in favor of the developers. Um, I know a lot of people feel like the deck is stacked against them, but you know, here's what I know. Uh, I would like to see trees go in that field. Uh, my family would like to see trees. Uh, the students of Waterloo Region would like to see trees. The teachers of Waterloo Region would like to see trees. Uh, people of Laurelwood want trees. People of Conservation Meadows want trees. People of North Lake Woods want trees. And a couple of developers want condos. And, you know, the vision for development in Waterloo uh, should be reflecting the values of the citizens of Waterloo. And the people of Waterloo want trees. Uh, we should find a way to make that happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean, for your thoughtful comments. Uh, just a reminder that, you know, this is an informal public meeting, so... ...give further comments at the formal public meeting when that occurs. Questions for Sean. Councillor Whaley, Councillor... Okay. Councillor Whaley. Very passionate uh, statements tonight, Sean. Thank you very much. The, uh, uh, the question is here, and, and I like your opinion on this, uh, is that somebody owns this property, has value. Uh, the, these 15 uh, lots may be worth 20 million bucks. I don't know. Let's just say, let's just say it is 20 million. So how are we going to, uh, in your view, how are we going uh, to get to your view? potential uh, opportunity here. Right. Well, you know, if, if the developer had not cut his own road through this forest, um, you know, 12 years ago, uh, we probably wouldn't be considering a development in there at all. You know, it, you know, you can have as much money as you want, but you still should not be able to disregard environmental protections. Uh, so, I mean, just based on the history, this really shouldn't be happening. And, you know, the, the forest around this field has been designated as environmentally sensitive for a reason. People and dogs and cats and lights and roads and salt and all that kind of stuff. Uh, if the ESPA designation has any meaning, uh, the meaning should be to protect it from stuff like this. 
Further questions for Sean? Seeing none. Thank go. Oh, oh, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. And a question from Councillor Freeman to staff. Um, so I had a question. If um, as a part of this process, um, if the region for open space or restoration as a part of this process then does it get can it be rezoned to G1 right at that time through your mayor Jaworski to Councillor Freeman uh, the zoning of the property is within council's hands so based on the assessment that's determined through the process council can elect to zone the property as it, as it determines appropriate and can you just remind me the, the McNally properties? I was just trying to look it up on is it zoned? Classification of green, it is zoned, but it is zoned green, um, most likely green one, which is a conservation zone, I believe. that's helpful thank you next up uh, uh, delegate number four Kevin Thomason welcome Kevin and Kevin you have 10 minutes Excellent. and 20 seconds <laughs> my name is Kevin Thomason and I live at 1115 Cedar Grove Road Waterloo just west of these proposed developments we have to remember that the plan is to try to fit a community of over 6,000 plus people, a town the size of Perry Sound, into a few fields on the outskirts of Waterloo in a very, very environmentally sensitive region. While there will be thousands of new car trips per day and significant human impact, we appreciate the effort for buffers, naturalized areas, trails, and trying to ensure a sustainable community. There is one significant remaining issue, though, where it seems that the quest for developer profits is being put far ahead of the public good or even good planning. This is the hole in the donut. For years, we were told, don't worry, it isn't what we're discussing here tonight, or that there'd be an entire process, or special studies, or lots of opportunity to make sure that it is protected. Given the constraints of ESP 80, the regional official plan, the city official plan, provisionally significant wetlands, GRCA constraints, many said that it is unlikely to ever be developed. Even the developer's own maps show just how remote, isolated, and surrounded by protected areas on all the sides this area is, and how narrow the roads into it will be. Alternatives were to be investigated to restore and naturalize the hole in the donut, or even just to do nothing or leave it natural. It appears that this hasn't been done, and the EIS remains incomplete. What was shown as asterisks for years, or even not shown on development maps included in the district plan, and on maps shown by uh, Laura Dwar here this evening, uh, now shows uh, sorry, these maps all show no development in the hole in the donut at all. Imagine the surprise and the dismay of the public to see these maps that show the complete development of the hole in the donut and be told by staff and councillors that it is now too late to change anything. It is a done deal. Worst yet, not only is the entire hole in the donut developed, but it is being done as a private condominium corporation because there is no way that the road could meet the standards for a public road. As you've just heard, this wouldn't even be possible if it wasn't for the illegal cutting and clearing that was done by the developer a few years ago under the guise of needing a 35 meter wide laneway to get six meter wide agricultural, agricultural equipment into the field. Now, conveniently, this broad clearing is just the exact minimum width, almost to the inch, needed for a private roadway through this area, given all the extremes that are going to have to be required to service homes in this remote area. Servicing such a small number of condominium lots is going to be expensive and a challenge given the distance and the remoteness of this area in the forest. For example, according to the wastewater maps proposed by the developer, some sewer lines are going to be buried over eight meters deep. That is almost two and a half stories underground. This will require considerable dewatering, pumping, and water taking permits that their own reports acknowledge could damage the surrounding ESPA lands. We have endured considerable issues and significant cost overruns with dewatering and deep sewers very near uh, here with Weidman Road and the incredible challenges they faced when water tables proved to be far more extensive than anticipated. Also with Beaver Creek and Laurel Creek 
And with the uh, dozen plus species of fish that can be found in each of the streams in this area, each running so close to the hole in the donut, dewatering could have significant impacts, be it from the water pumping or even the significant water dumping. Even more concerning is the proposed plan for stormwater runoff for this area. Instead of being channeled to the stormwater management ponds, like most of the proposed development, the plan is to try to use permeable pavement and a swale with runoff and any overflow being dumped directly into the ESPA. As you can see by the arrows in the top of the uh, donut ring road. Permeable pavement only works in warm seasons. And at the worst possible time of year, in winter when the ground is frozen, all the salt and road runoff could be running into the surrounding ESPA forests and wetlands with no treatment, not even the usual swim pond settling ponds uh, that are found elsewhere. Unfortunately, the plan for the hole in donut gets even worse for the surrounding flora and fauna. Because of the lengths the engineers are going to for the servicing of the hole in the donut, and because of the contours of the land, the narrow private roadway into the subdivision is going to be a highly elevated, sloped, and contoured road. In fact, for much of its length, this road is going to be like an elevated highway, 16 feet or a story and a half up in the air with steep banks and even imposing concrete walls for much of the north side of its length. You can see here the gray shading of the steep slope up to the road and the dark line of the concrete wall to the north. Looking at the developer's cut through profile to the road, you can see the existing grate that's a dotted line way down in the bottom, and then the steep uh, uh, profile of the road. Further up the road, we can see the barrier to wildlife the concrete wall could present. This is going to create a significant barrier to wildlife movement across the ESPA, especially when coupled with the streetlights and any traffic up on this road. While the plans show two culverts under the road, wildlife might be able to use, one is so small it's being measured in millimeters, and the other only three feet high and longer, much longer than the width of this room. Hardly welcoming or inviting for most species. We have to remember that this hole in the donut area is a significant wildlife corridor and will be one of the last natural paths in and out of the entire Laurel Creek Conservation Area, as subdivisions increasingly surround it on every side, turning it into an isolated island. The EIS and in other studies show the importance of this natural corridor over a vast area and for a vast area. I fear that this elevated roadway and concrete walls will form a wall and barrier to movement that even Donald Trump would be proud of. It gets worse. In addition to the road creating a significant barrier to wildlife movement, it appears that there's a chain link fence planned for along the property of the condo and the Laurel Creek Conservation Area, which will further impede wildlife and could further negatively impact ESPA 80. Confounding things even further and increasing the isolation of this condo development, I have not been able yet to find any plan for sidewalks or even a trail into this area. Given that the road is already so narrow, it can only be a private road and not meet the requirements for a public road, I question how sidewalks will fit in such a narrow area bordered by such steep slopes and walls. Will it even be safe to walk along the edge of the road, or might guardrails be needed even for any sidewalk? This is going to be a development with only one access point, a long, looping cul-de-sac with extremely limited access going against all smart growth principles and vision for the community. This extremely limited access and remoteness could create significant emergency access issues. Given the problems we are facing with the emergency entrance gates into Vista Hills and how we are told they are mandatory, it is dumbfounding to see how this condo development can be built with only one entrance and not even a footpath reaching it. In Columbia Forest, we've already seen issues and delays in emergency response because of the narrow streets, and this road is planned to be even narrower. What if there is a gas leak, car accident, fire, or hostage situation that blocks the one and only access? When I compare the plan we are being presented here today with what we have seen and what we've been told for so many years, there is a serious disconnect. In fact, let's look at the Waterloo vision and principles outlined in the 2015 Beaver Creek Meadows District Plan. My apologies, this is small, it's literally right from the plan. This condo development, the hole in the donut, is not going to be pedestrian oriented or transit supportive. It is not going to be distinguished by great urban design. It does not have strong connections to the natural heritage system, doesn't even have a trail, and might not even have public access of any form. It doesn't offer modal, multimodal options, and it is extremely long route to the west, north, and then east, and then south to get around to anything. It is not conserving or enhancing natural features or, function, or functions, but threatening them. 
It is not improving wildlife circulation, but cutting it off. It is costing the potential for great deep forest interior habitat restoration, not facilitating it. It is not providing connections to neighboring districts and parkland, and few would state that this is good sustainable environmental practices. This will not reduce car dependence. It does not provide a diversity of mobility routes or nodes. It does not provide amenities within a short and direct walking distance. It does not provide a road system sensitive to the natural environment, nor does it ensure connectivity and adjacent road or trail systems. A private condo community with no public access to such environmentally important lands is not likely creating great community or open space system. Paving over the donut, even with permeable paving, is not enhancing natural heritage, local parks or communities, and does not promote connections or views. It is hard to imagine how the access road with deep servicing, dewatering, and its forbidding final form uh, couldn't be more, of a, uh, more brutal to local natural ecosystems. Private condo lands and roads just don't seem to be congruent with the spirit of barn raising uh, in the Waterloo community. In conclusion, this sure doesn't sound like good planning to me. Just because something can be built doesn't mean that it should be built. There is so much good potential to restore this field into deep forest interior habitat and seemingly so many negatives and issues for trying to fit 15 condos here that could be met with the same housing unit needs by simply adding a floor or two to a condo building in uptown Waterloo. I realize that there are no decisions to be made tonight, and I hope that much as we worked over the past decade, we can find ways to live up to the City of Waterloo motto of environment of first and eliminate this illogical part of the condo development to ensure that we can continue on the path to being a balanced, sustainable, and world-class community. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. You'll be, you'll be sad to know you left a minute and 30 seconds on the table. Ah. Oh. But, we'll, but we'll have some <laughs> questions for you. Uh, questions for the delegate? Uh, seeing none, nope. but a question of staff. Thank you, Kevin. Excellent. Thank you. A question of staff. Councillor Freeman, please. Um, so the, there was some very interesting and the road cross sections. Um, who does the review of that information? And, um, and I guess one of the things that comes to mind immediately is hydraulic conductivity between the sanitary sewer and the surrounding groundwater table. Mayor Jaworski, engineering staff, um, <coughs> our environmental planner and um, planning approval staff will all be looking at that. And we've already noted um, some concerns with, you know, chloride. More details on that. Um, I also have some concerns about um, the retaining wall and potential encroachment in the buffer and the wildlife crossings. Those are things that we've identified already and we want the applicant to provide um, further information on. That said, further information may not in and of itself mean that we, we can support that, those features. And I also would like more information on what the delegate made reference to in terms of backup for emergency vehicles and so on. It seemed like And the other thing that I was thinking about is there's a, there's a lot of work that's being done as of late with regard to INI work in, in sanitary sewers in particular. And just that's why I'm asking my questions around hydraulic conductivity and of the the pipes because it it doesn't seem to be that it takes long before they start leaking a little and I'm, I'm just feeling like this is a very environmentally sensitive area through you mayor Jaworski to Councillor Freeman say has been an issue that staff have been looking at in more and more detail every time a plan of subdivision comes through this community dating back you know to the early 2000s this has been certainly on our radar and every plan that comes through we are looking at both the uh, the footings for new houses and how they may be impacting groundwater tables but also infrastructure and proximity to those groundwaters the potential for I and I or siphoning water off in terms of dewatering areas reducing uh, groundwater tables or modifying groundwater tables um, The 
the, uh, the detailed reviews of the uh, applicant submissions in that regard. Next up, uh, delegate number five, Deb Swidrovich. Welcome, Deb. Good evening, Mayor Jaworski, uh, councillors, staff, and guests. My name is Deb Swidrovich, and I live on Wilmot Line in the city of Waterloo, uh, just west of uh, the proposed development. I'm here tonight to discuss some of the planning issues that I feel have not been addressed in the Northgate proposal, in particular the development plan for the open field surrounded by ESP 80. Let me start by expressing my disappointment to hear that we no longer have WCAC, the city's environmental advisory committee. I understand that instead we now have a sustainability advisory committee, but that this committee will not review subdivision applications as WCAC has in the past. It is unfortunate because we could use the expertise of the members with regard to this subdivision application. In the City of Waterloo official plan, it talks about giving direction with respect to the protection, management, and stewardship of the environment, maintaining, enhancing, and restoring the natural system and our water resources, and improving air quality and reducing contributions to climate change and encouraging sustainable development practices. The development of the open field in ESP 80 is not representative of sustainable planning. The Beaver Creek Meadows District Plan will house thousands of residents with thousands of vehicles. These residents will contribute considerably to the city's carbon footprint. And with the needed tree cover to counter the effects, we are not taking the necessary steps in this proposal to help counter the gas emissions in our own backyard. We should be asking much more for the health of our residents than what is being provided through this subdivision application and for the birds and animals in ESP80 who need the deep cover of bush to survive. We have an opportunity through this development process to correct the fragmentation of ESP80 by reforesting the laneway that was widened to provide access to this field and to enhance or reforest the field rather than building condos that will surely have an adverse impact on the birds and animals of ESP80. This is not sustainable development practice. In the provincial policy statement, it suggests a land use pattern, density, and mix of uses should be promoted that minimize the length and number of vehicle trips and support the development of viable choices and plans for public transit and other alternative transportation modes, including commuter rail and bus. If you look at the following map, right here, you can see um, there are four stop locations, uh, one here at Beaver Creek and Conservation Drive, and you have three more as you travel west. And now if you look at the next map, it, uh, th this shows possible trail locations, yet there is no trail location or footpath proposed for the condos in the open field surrounded by ESB 80 that would provide connection to the transit sites. This cul-de-sac type of planning, which has been banned in a number of states, is contrary to the type of grid-style planning that has been promoted for years. In this case, it isolates the condo owners from public transportation and forces them into their cars. This, is all, this also is not sustainable development practice. I'm also concerned about the risk to the residents with regard to access by fire, police, and emergency services. Here we have a long laneway that leads to several condos that encircle a central area surrounded by bush. There's no second emergency access. They don't propose one because that would have an adverse impact on ESB 80 and the plan would be shelved. A municipal road could not be built through an ESBA, so they propose a narrow private laneway to their condo development. I want you to think about what might happen if there was a fire at the entrance to that development, or if there was a situation where everyone needed to get out quickly, for example, a gas explosion, a police standoff, whatever, and that entrance was blocked. How would they get out? This is unsafe and certainly a dead end in more ways than one. Now you might say that this has already been looked at, but it is our experience that the comments that are provided by the different departments of the city don't always take everything into consideration. Some of us in this room have gone through a number of subdivision processes and we know that the comments made by staff at the public information centers, recommendations made by consultants and approved subdivision plans, and even the consultation between departments, for example, planning, consulting with roads, doesn't always happen. 
So I want to make sure that any comments submitted, especially with regard to the safety of the residents for this area is looked at very carefully. This would be of great concern for me and I believe a liability issue for the city if it was approved. It worries me to think that ESBA may be held in private ownership should this be passed. I'd like to show you a picture of a laneway that leads to a field that is part of the Laurel Creek ESL, not far from this location, just on the other side of Herbsville Road. This is within a protected area, similar to ESBA 80, but this is what a country laneway to a field that is protected should look like. It is owned by the city of Waterloo. Here you will see a threatened species, Blanding's turtle, crossing that laneway. This species has been found as recently as 2015 and 16 on Wilmot Line in Herbsville and on the GRC Nature Center property. They are elusive, but chances are they may be an ASPA 80. Deb Lehman, one of our volunteer photographers, will talk more about the species uh, that she's found uh, all across these areas. The owner of this field has a right of way and he leases the farm or field to a farmer. Even with the trimming of the riparian area to make way for larger equipment that was needed to install a cell tower in that field, this laneway remains a country laneway. Now compare that with the clear cutting of ESB 80 at the entrance to the field. We may disagree whether this was legal or illegal, but the fact remains that this laneway in an ESPA was clear cut. A good steward of that land would have replaced the trees, enhanced the property, including the preservation of the smaller wetlands. In my opinion, they have effectively degraded ESPA to over time, and the future of this ESP should not be left in their hands or a condo corporation. <coughs> I would also like to talk to you about the adjacent GRC property. I want you to think about the natural areas of the GRC lands and what they may look like in the future. Some of that area may be protected now under the ownership of the GRC in the region of the city, but you must know that these very creative developers likely have eyes on all property from this subdivision all the way to Humphrey's Garage on Beaver Creek Road. The GRC lands that they suggest in this report that provide suitable habitat for some of the species found in ESP80 may also be under threat from future development as well. We need to ensure that our significant natural areas as well as the connectivity of continuous canopied woodlands and environmentally sensitive corridors are not only protected but strengthened. In closing, I'd like to remind Council of the recommendations provided by the city's consultants, not the developer's consultants, who said in the November 2015 discussion paper for the Beaver Creek Meadows District Plan, to protect the existing natural heritage features and functions associated with the ESPA, and they, they mean ESPA 80, it is our recommendation that all or part of this ESPA area should be naturalized or allowed to regenerate through natural plant succession to the fullest extent possible. Restoration of the open field would provide a measurable enhancement to an existing core environmental feature, particularly from a significant wildlife habit perspective that is forest interior birds. Now, just as a side note, I'd like to try and answer uh, Councillor Whaley's question, and that is uh, the rights of the property owner. I, I think they do have rights, but I think they have to prove that there won't be any adverse impacts on ESP 80. And I think from what you've heard tonight, there are several that we need to consider. So, so that's what their rights are. They can build there, provided it doesn't have an adverse impact on ESP 80. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Deb. Uh, questions for the delegate, please. Uh, Councilor Whaley up first. Uh, knew, knew that we'd see here tonight on this uh, issue. So we heard uh, two uh, informal hearings grouped together tonight uh, affecting a large area of, uh, this, of these lands. But, you're, but you're, you, know, you, you just talk about a small little piece of that. So do we, uh, in your mind, do we uh, to scrap the entire subdivision because of this issue? Or how do you, how do you see us how you see us severing this off? Uh, larger development. I don't know. I, you know, every time you pass the Beaver Creek District Plan and you haven't addressed this issue, I said don't do that. So every step of the way, I keep saying don't do this until you've got all the answers. Um,
happens in the last years. Most of it here in our ESL area. Um, so I'm going to touch on that. Um, I'm not going to really talk about a whole lot of what everybody else has been speaking of, but I want to just say to Mayor Jarowski and the councillors, thanking you all for letting me speak tonight. Um, so the Northgate proposal, this is what I'm talking about, the hole in the donut, the widened laneway, the first thing I'm going to point here is that I've been a ph wildlife photographer for 10 years, mostly with Laurel Creek Headwaters, about 85% of my work. My images are used as pictorial inventories to prove that species exist in any given area that I'm working. Um, I've spent over 3,000 hours in the Laurel Creek ESL staring at wildlife and trees and so forth. Um, we have huge biodiversity there. We have the, the Waterloo Moraine. Everybody knows this. Um, and the first picture here you see is a great egret. So that's the Creekside Church. Um, there's a, like a heritage pond there that's been there for quite a while. I'm taking it this green button up here is my... No? <laughs> How do you... Oh, here? Click the mouse. There we go. Good, thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to show some pictures of Creekside and a little bit around where the hole in the donut is, things that are close to it. So this night, uh, night heron, it's a juvenile. It was, and this was like eight years ago, um, roughly speaking. It was trying to eat a painted turtle. Didn't, was a teenager bird, didn't really know what, what it should be eating yet. But this is all Creekside, so this is showing that this pond is holding uh, wintering grounds for these turtles. The turtle on the left is just laid eggs. I watched it that day, um, so she's using the gravel in the Creekside Church to lay her eggs. The others, there was lots of turtles in this pond, um, and they wintered there. And there's other wetlands throughout that area. This is the barn swallow on the left, is a, a male barn swallow feeding his fledgling uh, young, and the ones on the right are babies waiting to be fed. These birds have declined 90% in the last 20, 25 years on the eastern seaboard of North America. I think personally from all the watching I'm doing is insecticides, the decline of our insects because these guys, that's what they eat, is insects. So this is the other side of the, the hole in the donut would be on the far side of the bush that you're seeing behind the swan and the ducks. So the trumpeter swan, I believe they might still be sorrow listed. They were almost wiped to extinction 150 years ago for ladies to wear their plumage around their neck. Um, they're they, they tag them, they watch them. This trumpeter swan happened to land right next to the area we're discussing tonight, probably on migration. Um, the ducks, of course, are, are, you know, they're there year round. But it just giving you a close up of the trumpeter swan. And the reason I knew it was a trumpeter swan, or, it, you know, it has a black beak, it was the coloring and what have you. So we, we figured that out. It might have even had a tag. I got a feeling if I pulled it in closer, you could see a tag. But you can see the date too. It's 2014. So I've got varying dates on my pictures just to show you. What I've noticed in 10 years is a drop in biodiversity. And, and what I want to touch on is I'm pain disabled. So the hole in the donut area in ESPA 80, I haven't done lots of work with it. I've had other people that have gone through there. They seem what they thought to be vernal pools, which would be amphibian habitat. But having said this, I've done a lot with the Herbsville Lane that Deb just showed you on the last, uh, on her presentation. And I've spent a lot of time here. So again, this is a photographer I brought on board. We have a Blanding's turtle. We have a close-up there of it. So that's a sorrow-listed turtle. It's a threatened species. 
a northern map turtle, another sorrow listed turtle. That baby was found in the Herbsville Park area. And we were told that these turtles don't really frequent this area, that the closest place that they might frequent is the reservoir. But there was some thought with professionals that maybe the turtle was dropped by a bird because you, you've seen the other picture where the, yeah, and that's what they do. I mean, animals, they try to survive as best they can. So this was 2012, that picture. The one before was 2016. So the species are there, it wasn't when I first came. It took me eight years to photograph a Blanding's turtle and thousands of hours. I had never even seen a Blanding's turtle in my life. So that kind of tells you something. I've never seen a map turtle either, by the way. And this is a snapping turtle. Most everyone in this room, I'm sure, has seen one of those. They are actually, oops, sorry, sorrow listed also. Um, and that's a mama. Most of the turtle species, it's just the females that come out of the water for the most part, even in the ocean. And I've been a diver and done underwater photography. So I photograph sea turtles too. The turtle on the right is the baby that was hatched. So most likely, because this was the same exact area, that mama on the left, that's probably one of her hatchlings, if the truth is known. Um, so that's 2013. And snapping turtles are more visible. More people see those. Red-headed woodpeckers, another, another sorrow listed. All these animals were in Herbsville, where Deb showed the narrow lane and the good stewardship that the city of Waterloo put forth. I have a great fear that the hole in the donut, ESP 80 forest, the wetlands, that these creatures are in there. And, and when they do these assessments, they bring people in for a few days or a few hours out of a year. I'm finding the species because I'm there every day looking, <laughs> literally. I mean, I... I figured out my hours years ago, one hour every day for six, hour, uh, six years. That's what it equated to. When you spend that kind of time, you're going to see things. I, I mean, and I'm a volunteer, so, you know, I'm not, this isn't my paid job. I work at Grand River Hospital. Oh, by the way, that's a male, uh, sorry, an adult uh, woodpecker on the left. That's a juvenile. That's in Herbsville. So you see juvenile birds. There's a really good chance that they were born. That's their natal area. Could have been migration, but I've seen redhead woodies a few times. Um, monarch butterfly, we all know they're on the sorrow list, and they're, you know, they're on a decline. All nature fluctuates, it's cyclical. So when we throw a stick into things, not, it's not good. Nature can't keep up with the sticks we're throwing at them in, in this day and age. So there's a bumblebee, another pollinator, and the little garter snake baby, that's in Herbsville. I've found milk snakes, which are sorrow listed. I have roadkill pictures. I did, thought I, you don't need to see them, but I'll tell you about it that they're right next to Herbsville Road and Conservation Drive, twice, run over by cars. So milk snakes are a species on decline and they're in this area. That's a Canada warbler, same thing again, another sorrow listed creature. Um, warblers are pretty elusive, most people don't see them, but there's 100 varieties of them in North America and a lot of them are sorrow listed. Bald Eagle was in Herbsville. He, it was wintertime. He was mucking around, flushing out what he could. They, they like fish, but they'll eat anything as our, our creatures decline. They'll forage in the garbage dump. I've seen them there. Um, but the Bald Eagle was in Herbsville. And what's to say he wouldn't forage on something in the hole in the donut that died? Because they will do that. They will scavenge if they have to. And that's my last picture around Herbsville that I decided to show you tonight. That's a mink in his den in the winter. In 10 years, that's about the fourth picture of a mink I've got. Most wildlife's elusive. We don't see it. So when assessments are done and all this stuff is done and people say, it's not there, we didn't see it, we can't record it, I say it well, most likely is there. I've spent lots of time with, with critters. One thing I want to say about the re... If, if it was ever to happen in that spot where it's bare and there's no trees in that hole in the donut, 
about 30% of our oxygen, so every third breath you take tonight in this room is coming from all the trees and flora in the world. The other 70 comes from the oceans, and the oceans aren't in good shape either. So I'm just trying to throw my perspective on this because I've been a naturalist, animal lover, and now a conservationist for the last 10 years. And I'm proud to say I'm working with ocean conservation because I've seen the decline in our oceans. But I think everything is important. And speaking to the gentleman here, whoever you are that is wanting to put condos in, you know, you, in the end, we can't eat money. We can't. And uh, I don't know. I, I just hope... I can touch on somebody's conscience tonight, and and if you have a chance to get out and enjoy nature, go for it. Thank you very much, Deb. Uh, questions for the delegate? Oh, the herbs fill. In the hole in the donut with the hands and that, and I would like to see in that lane way be smaller, yeah. just like it was in Herbsville. Yeah. No, understood. I think. Is there anyone here else tonight who would speak? taken into consideration in developing a staff position on this application and a staff report will be considered by council during a Um, Mayor Jaworski, members of council and the public tonight, um, as you've just said, this is the informal public meeting for this application. Um, I'm going to try and be brief. This is a, an aerial image of the subject lands. Um, it's made up of three parcels, and they're bound generally by Conservation Drive, Roy Smith Road, Wasega Crescent, and Rideau River Street, with the exception of this block here, which is on the separated by, yeah. Um, the lands to the north are um, known as Conservation Meadows Neighborhood. It's approximately eight, eight hectares in size. This is just another perspective looking generally southward, um, and you can see how this parcel sort of fits in with some of the surrounding uh, existing development. There's no significant um, environmental features on these lands, um, so major distinction from the lands we, we just were speaking about. Um, so this is the draft plan of subdivision that's been uh, submitted by the applicant. Uh, you can see that it um, it involves the extension of uh, Wasega Crescent um, and also Cranberry Street and uh, Kawartha Street as well in this location here. Um, it's basically an extension of an existing neighborhood. Uh, the, there's basically uh, 13 blocks, mostly single detached dwellings here, but also street fronting towns. There's some multiple residential blocks fronting along Conservation Drive. Those could 
contain more medium density types of housing or a mix of uses in a mixed use building here at the corner where the lands are within the node. Full build out of the subdivision would contain 182 to 223 new units and there's also a hydro core there that bisects the development. This is the proposed zoning schedule to implement the draft plan of subdivision. The lands are currently zoned agriculture. Uh, they're proposing to rezone the lands uh, single detached, which permits singles and semis. Medium density three, which is permits a range of uses anywhere from towns to apartments. Or green two for the walkway connections you see in this location and in this location. So in addition to changing the zoning categories, they're looking at tailoring the performance regulations, changing things like setbacks, landscape open space, building heights, parking, and density to suit uh, the specific types of development that they're envisioning here. Within the city's official plan, lands are entirely designated low-density residential. Conservation Drive is a major, major collector, and Rideau River Street is a minor collector. As I already mentioned uh, in my previous presentation tonight, um, these lands are within the district plan that was completed in uh, 2015. There was also the NEA that was uh, completed at that time to assess the overall infrastructure needs for the area. So more specifically within the district plan, the lands are categorized as low density residential one, that's the yellow, light yellow lands, low density residential two, the orange lands, mixed use medium density residential, which is the brown lands, they're also within what's considered to be the node. Um, as, as I already mentioned, the, the, um, the plan does include design policies that speak to no backlotting along Conservation Drive, and it also restricts driveway access. And I discussed previously some of the other projects that would directly and indirectly um, impact the development of these lands, so that communal swim facility that they're evaluating on the Martin lands, uh, this, this subdivision would um, relies on the construction of that stormwater management facility. So the applicant submitted a number of studies. I've listed them here. Um, they are all currently under, a uh, review of these studies is underway currently. Just speaking to the uh, turn lane analysis, um, does recommend a westbound left turn lane at Cranberry and also uh, an east and west left turn lanes at Rideau River Street upon full build out of the subdivision, which is estimated to be around 2023. Um, but at this time, we're not pr proposing any road upgrades along this section of Conservation Drive. Though so there's a number of as aspects the development will be looking at further. Um, the functional size, shape, grading of those lots, how the whole plan aligns with the district plan, um, whether the zoning as proposed implements the district plan vision, um, whether the performance regulations are appropriate. Um, we're also uh, going to be processing the community stormwater management facility study sort of concurrently with this application because the two um, are very much connected. Um, another thing is the parkland dedication component here. So our preference with Greenfield Development is always to get the land for parks rather than cash and lieu. And in this case, there's no actual parkland. Um, the district plan did show a sort of extension of Wasega Park. So in this location, um, but the plan as submitted does not include that extension rather um, it is, it is the applicant's opinion that b because of the grading in this area, it's not conducive to a park, an extension of that park. We did ask them to look at um, some other possible extension opportunities and we may still be doing that through the process. Um, so, generally concludes my presentation tonight. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Laura. Questions?
So these lots here would have, I think, retaining walls at the back of the lots. That's how significant the grade change would be. It is possible in this scenario we could accept, I mean, we have options here. We could concept, accept all cash and lieu or, or there's a combination there of potentially. Um, and if we, if we did accept cash and lieu, we would probably put it back into Wasega Park. I guess I'd raise as a as, as a query for for further you know review. I, I know in the previous set Seeing none, thank you very much again, Laura. Uh, one delegate registered, Dave Aston. Welcome again, Dave. I'd like to just introduce uh, Joe Group uh, from Stantec, who's our engineer, and Jason Malfara uh, with Activa Group here uh, tonight. And again, if there's any questions, um, uh, we'll look to them for some details. Uh, I'll flip through my presentation again. Ms. Dewar's uh, pretty much covered off uh, the information, uh, but I want to just speak to maybe a couple things here. Um, and one of them right away uh, in response to the question with regard to noise. Uh, noise study was done for road, um, and also it looked at uh, uh, the noise across the street from uh, the existing operation. So it looked at road noise and and the existing stationary noise. Uh, with regard to the road noise, uh, the analysis was done based on units uh, fronting onto Conservation Drive. So this is a scenario where uh, there's a proposal for a window street and then the unit. So there's uh, a kind of built-in setback by design and then the fronting of units onto Conservation Drive. So the units in effect uh, act as a noise wall. As I get later on the presentation, you'll, you'll see a preliminary uh, drawing of that. Uh, so again, here's the master plan, approximately 182 to 279 units. 
based on uh, single detach uh, dwellings and then a range um, based on density permissions associated with the multiple blocks along Conservation Drive. Right now the preliminary thinking is uh, lands around the park uh, would be street townhouses, which is similar to uh, what's already built uh, within that area. And then the lands uh, along Conservation Drive that would front that would be um, a back-to-back -back townhouse or it could also be a stacked townhouse type of development. But at this point, uh, the idea is a back-to-back -back townhouse concept. Um, as far as connectivity, uh, with development of this plan would come the continue extension of the trail through the hydro corridor from the park. So that would finish off that trail connection down to Conservation Drive where it would be picked up by sidewalks and uh, ultimately through connections um, that, that would or could occur through uh, the lands to the south. Uh, the plan of subdivision, again, uh, just some of the details around it there, uh, multiple blocks along Conservation Drive a mix of street townhouses and, and single detached. In this case, the density is a bit higher, uh, 67 to 104 people in jobs per hectare. Uh, this site really is an extension of the existing neighborhood. What happened in the past was uh, this, this part of the site, because of the grades, was brought into uh, the sub-watershed study that was completed as part of the North Waterloo sub-watershed study because of the catchment area associated with the grades. The other portion uh, was assessed as part of uh, you know, the previous catchment area uh, sub-watershed study. So when talking about grades, that really is part of the difference and, and part of the change. Residential. We are dealing with grade differences that were really established and recognized even with the difference in timing associated with the sub-watershed studies. Um, Ms. Stewart went over the proposed zoning again. Many of the uh, requested specific provisions are based on uh, the unit types being proposed as it relates to townhouses and uh, stacked townhouses or back-to-back -to -back townhouses. Uh, regional official plan, fairly straightforward. Uh, greenfield area, no green lands on the site. Uh, designated residential, the o only open space identified is the park, and Ms. Stewart mentioned with regard to the road system. Um, and that collector road uh, that just seems to end would extend through the adjacent Madame Cook lands and then connect back down through Conservation Drive. What I would mention as part of uh, this uh, application and community plan was how Roy Schmidt Road is being closed, and uh, that's being uh, traffic is really being dealt with through the internal local road connection and then the, the new uh, local road in the Madame e. Cook land. So there'll be connections to that road, but Roy Schmidt Road is being closed because of its proximity to the roundabout at Beaver Creek Road and Conservation Drive. Um, just an overlay, again, as far as the plan, uh, generally compliance, a uh, couple comments here that were raised, the temporary swim facility uh, was always identified really as a, a temporary solution if required. Um, working with the consolidated stormwater management pond and the broader area, um, there is a solution where the stormwater is controlled and the details of that as far as distance and speed and noise of water um, are really details, um, but uh, it's being controlled it's coming down to uh, uh, pipe or system along Conservation Drive and then connecting into a uh, 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 storm sewer pipe that will be built down Beaver Creek Road as part of that reconstruction and all in association uh, with the discussion around the consolidated stormwater management facility. So the idea of the temporary pond in the sub-watershed study was that if there was uh, a, a pond solution um, that the temporary pond wouldn't be required, then it would proceed with uh, the permanent solution. In fact, the, the temporary pond relates to drainage of these lands through the Martin lands into a pond on the Martin lands. So the, um, the proposal to take the water from these lands 
into the storm pipe and down onto the pond on the Martinlands generally reflects what was being considered at the time of the, the scope sub watershed study. And now we just have more detail in design to implement that. Uh, the very other variation is, uh, you'll see here, Wasega Crescent was identified to extend. Um, we have not extended it uh, there, but uh, what we've done instead is a pedestrian walkway connection. So we've had discussion with staff on that design and as it relates to the design of the adjacent lands. So that's something that we'll further uh, consider with staff. And then the last variation uh, really is the park. And uh, again, what we have assessed is because of the grade change um, and how the park needs to grade down to what we're calling street four, which is really this street here. Uh, there's a significant change that would require a large wall somewhere, uh, whether at the park or at the street or at the back of lots. Um, so we've looked at that and concluded that it's, it's not appropriate to extend the park in that direction. And I think Councillor Henry was referencing the figure that's in the report as three to four meter difference. Um, and so that's the proposal to staff, which uh, by the comment we heard uh, staff are looking, uh, looking at and considering and uh, anticipate we'll hear comments back. Uh, the technical studies, um, typical studies identified uh, through the pre-application process all have been submitted and currently under review. Uh, this is, it's, it's hard to see, but really the details of the servicing location of the sanitary servicing uh, infrastructure and the water servicing in infrastructure all connecting to Conservation Drive. On there you'll see just so that we could get an idea of the preliminary design and how it works with servicing, um, preliminary block layouts and you'll see the uh, Conservation Drive, what I'll call it, and there's a width there for an easement to bring the services along Conservation Drive. Then there's a a uh, private road or window street and then the front of townhouse units. So the combination of the setback and the fronting of units on to Conservation Drive is what really creates a difference between noise considerations for this development and say noise considerations whereas Ms. Stewart suggested a, a back lotted scenario. Um, really conclusions uh, were uh, in conformity with, with the guiding policy documents as far as land use designations. The site is a, a logical extension of the existing uh, plan of subdivision and neighborhood. Uh, reflects the recommendations generally of Beaver Creek Meadows District Plan through the zoning where there's some variation. In our opinion there's justification for that and really uh, again similar to the other application where uh, into the start of the process, awaiting comments back, and we'll work with staff to respond uh, to comments where necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, questions of the delegate, Councillor Reith. About some calming measures that we have implemented in. Uh, through Other your, area oh, there. Through Mayor Jorski uh, to the councillor.
is is another right. one as well. But that looks like a nice long, straight, wide stretch that might be easy to speed down. <laughs> Just saying. Right. Noted. And I think this picture answers my question is going to be, is there access to the Wasega Park from the new streets? And it is all along the hydro corridor there. Is that a walk? King is still a some years. 